workers from Florida and Texas whose companies were awarded contracts by HUD. Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. Today's HUD hearing is really two different hearings in one. First, we will examine policy lessons to be learned from the HUD scandal as it impacts on federal employees. Then we will continue our investigation of abuses and favoritism in HUD programs during the tenure of Samuel Pierce. Last summer, there was an excellent cartoon in the Federal Times about what happened at HUD. It showed the large vault at HUD, which was empty, except for one box that wasn't taken. This box was labeled unheeded staff advice. It is clear that had the advice of HUD career employees been taken, hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money could have been saved. The men and women of HUD, the career employees, are honest, responsible, hardworking individuals who are committed to the housing programs that they administer. The trouble was that the people on top, political appointees, did not share that commitment to provide decent and affordable housing for all Americans. In some cases, the political appointees were openly antagonistic, antagonistic to the very programs they were supposed to administer. It has been said that putting someone like Hunter Cushing at HUD, where he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary, is like having <coughs> pacifists run the Department of Defense. The career staff at HUD have not been the source of the problems that have surfaced at our year-long series of hearings. There have been a few isolated incidents of uh, misconduct by career employees, such as the accountant at the Denver office who stole a million dollars by electronically transferring the funds from HUD's account at Treasury to his personal account. However, overwhelmingly, the abuses resulted from outside contractors, phony consultants, and unqualified political appointees. We will be discussing the HUD scandal and its impact on career employees with two distinguished members of the National Commission on Public Service, the so-called Volcker Commission. I am very pleased that uh, Mr. Elliot Richardson and Mr. Rocco Siciliano could be with us. I am also delighted that uh, the executive director of the commission, distinguished former ambassador Bruce Langan, has also been able to join us, and we are delighted to welcome all three of you. I regret that because of an unavoidable scheduling conflict, Chairman Volker could not be with us today. Elliot Richardson personifies the very best in public service. His name is synonymous with integrity. If you look up the word integrity in the dictionary, you are likely to see Elliot Richardson's picture. During the past 30 years, he has served in more positions in our government than the Yankees have had managers. <laughs> Elliot Richardson has served as Attorney General of the United States, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, a most distinguished ambassador to the court of St. James, United States Attorney, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Massachusetts, and as the President's Special Representative to the Law of the Sea Conference. This is just the beginning of his biographical sketch. Mr. Rocco Siciliano has had a long and distinguished career in public service. Having served as Under Secretary of Commerce, Assistant Secretary of Labor, Special Assistant to President Eisenhower for Personnel Management, 
the member of the Federal Pay Board. He strongly believes in and represents the highest ideals of government service. Later today, we will hear testimony from two developers, Mr. Leonard Briscoe, Mr. Jeffrey Auslander, who appeared to have benefited from favoritism in hot programs. Mr. Briscoe is appearing before the subcommittee today under subpoena. <clears throat> we intend to explore with him his relationship and financial dealings with Lance Wilson, who was Secretary Pierce's top aide, and with Mr. Du Bois Gilliam, a former HUD Deputy Assistant Secretary. Next month, I plan to send a letter to the Independent Counsel, Judge Arlen Adams, requesting that his inquiry be expanded into certain additional arenas and setting forth in detail evidentiary support for enlarging the Independent Counsel's investigative mandate. Finally, we are preparing a report on these hot hearings, which I hope will be ready to be voted on by the subcommittee early this fall. And before we begin this morning's hearing, I again want to express my appreciation to uh, my entire subcommittee staff, but particularly the three individuals who worked so hard on today's hearing, Andrea Nelson, Celia Boddington, and our Chief of Staff, Stuart Weisberg. Secretary <coughs> uh, Richardson, Ambassador Richardson, we shall, of course, not swear in this panel, which is a, which is a, a, a departure from our procedure. On behalf of uh, all of us, uh, uh, I want to welcome you. And before I ask you to proceed, I'd like to call on the ranking uh, Republican member, Congressman Lukens, to make any observation he wants to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's really with a great deal of um, regretful anticipation that we go into yet another hearing on what appears to be the bottomless pit of non-management at HUD. And I, too, wish to join the chairman and other members of the panel in welcoming this particular group of experts before us because of the high standards to which you uh, all have adhered during your time of public service. We're really concerned here that the system within HUD appears not to have changed much in the several years mm -hmm. of existence. And as a result, the system apparently lends itself to not only mismanagement, but graft, corrupt and corruption, and really the, the term non-management. There just doesn't appear to have been anyone in control down there for periods of time. We are anxious from all sides of the panel to investigate in depth <coughs> solutions and answers to the questions that have been raised through the two years of hearing now, and what looks like maybe yet another year of hearing. I, too, wish to join the chairman in uh, extending my congratulations for a job well done, particularly to our minority staff, Mr. Albrecht, and to all members of staff that worked on this, because it, it appears to be that the work is never ending and will yet be unceasing in the immediate months to come. Specifically, I would like to address two areas that I would like the member of the panel after your presentation to consider the first being the extent to which the lack of management or lack of control exists at different levels within HUD, whether all of this could take place at the top with and without the knowledge of the chief ex executing officer or could take place at the staff level next to that uh, the departmental chief. The second would be suggested answers is where do we go from here to stop this nonsense and to bring an end to mismanagement and assist Secretary Kemp when I think has been an exemplary job in trying to correct problems. Those are two answers that I would particularly like addressed, or two questions I'd like particularly addressed uh, during the presentation of the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Congressman Martinez. Mr. Chairman, I have an opening statement. I look forward to testimony from both Th these uh, distinguished uh, witnesses. Thank you very much. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I join in, uh, in both your statement and that of Mr. Lukens in welcoming these witnesses. I think they have some unique perspectives uh, of their long service in government, and um, certainly we can benefit uh, from that in understanding better the um, ways in which our government uh, can better serve the people of this country, which after all is the ultimate goal that we all seek. I thank you for calling this hearing this morning and having these witnesses available to us. Thank you, Congressman Kyle. Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, want to express my words of welcome to our very distinguished panel of witnesses 
And I guess the area which I would like to uh, have explored would be that of how do we encourage uh, the professional staff, <coughs> the civil service staff, from coming forward when they, are, they become aware of irregularities in the running of the department and the awarding of, of grants and without their feeling that if they do that, they jeopardize their very survival within the agency. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome um, all our witnesses and, and say to you, Mr. Richardson, <coughs> uh, very candidly, you're one reason why I remained a Republican a few years ago. I don't know if I'd want the burden of being synonymous with integrity, but you did give me faith in my Republican Party when I think a number of us needed that faith. And I just want to say for, uh, I want you to know that Mr. Kyle does not always look like this. Uh, he was uh, up all night at a crime watch on the floor of the House in a special order uh, to encourage Congress to take action on violent crime and, and our drug problem. So um, if he's not as articulate as he always looks, his eyes aren't usually red like they are now. He was up all night last night doing the people's work. Um, Ambassador Richardson, again, welcome to uh, this uh, subcommittee. Uh, your entire prepared uh, statement will be entered in the record, <coughs> and uh, you may proceed any way you choose, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. May, may I ask you to pull the mic very close to you, sir? <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. I warmly appreciate the, the generosity of, of comments that have been made about the opportunities for public service that have been given to me by several presidents. I can only say that uh, I not only regarded these as a privilege, but I thoroughly enjoyed them. And I wish more Americans could become aware of the sheer satisfaction that flows from doing your best to identify and serve the public interest. It's a pleasure to appear here today with a very old friend and former colleague in government, <coughs> associate in other, I hope, believe, useful enterprises, Rocco Siciliano, and with the very able executive director of the National Commission on, Pub on the Public Service, <coughs> the Volk Commission, uh, Ambassador Bruce Langan, who's courage and steadfastness as the senior American hostage in Tehran epitomized the qualities of the career public services of the State Department. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, the first and most important thing I would like to say is that the record you have made through these hearings <clears throat> goes a long way toward giving concrete evidence in support of the, the general recommendations <clears throat> that emerged from the, the work of the Volcker Commission. I was the chairman of a subcommittee uh, that addressed the the relationship between political appointees and the career services. And we made a, a number of recommendations which appear in the Commission's report in Leadership for America, Rebuilding the Public Service. This report was presented to the President in March 1989 and in the period since then, the Commission has been working toward drawing public attention to the findings and recommendations of the report. The Commission's charter will be closed in just a few more days. And so, uh, as uh, representatives of the Commission, we particularly appreciate <laughs> this opportunity to present our concerns and opinions on the effects of unsatisfactory relationships between 
and political and, and career government managers. I said, Mr. Chairman, that I think the record in this hearing affords <coughs> numerous illustrations in support of these recommendations, insofar as they, they uh, embody situations in which something went wrong. <coughs> it would take too long to try to intersperse the general observations that, that I'd like to highlight now and, and uh, the particular references to the record that support them. <coughs> it's fair to say in any case that uh, it would uh, be useful to have a little more time to, to do this right. I've had the help of my associate Rick Hadel in recent days reviewing the record, which of course is a very voluminous one, as well as the help of a uh, <coughs> very capable member of the World Commission staff, Mr. Alan Jones, who is himself a a <coughs> career officer of the Department of Veteran of Veterans Affairs uh, seconded to the Volcker Commission under the Intergovernmental Personnel Act. With their help and your permission, Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit for the record what you might call an annotated version of my prepared statement, which would be interspersed with references to the record. Mr. Ambassador, we'll be delighted to keep the record open for that submission. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Let me go on then to, to uh, underscore a point that I know you have made a number of times from the position you occupy as the the, the uh, leader of uh, this inquiry. That is that in recent years, the <coughs> number of presidential appointees, whether those sub subject to Senate confirmation, non-career senior executives, or personal and confidential assistants, <coughs> has grown beyond the point of any useful contribution to the point, indeed, of becoming actually counterproductive. <coughs> the present total is some 3,000 political appointees. And the Commission believes that this number should be very substantially reduced and that 2,000 is a reasonable target. Second. We recommend that the President more frequently consider career officials for sub-cabinet appointments, taking advantage of a prime source of professionalism and experience to his or her administration. Third, the President and Congress should set a lower limit on the number of non-career senior executives allowed within a particular department or agency. Current law permits up to 25 percent of an agency's senior executives to be non-career appointees, thereby <coughs> crowding out opportunities for career officers. The basic considerations that led the Commission to make these recommendations are, first, that the President must be able to select his own people. Second, that career executives should play an active role in policy development. And third, <laughs> that government functions best without excessive layers of appointees between the political leadership who set policy and the career managers who are there to implement that policy. These basic propositions, it's fair to say, uh, <clears throat> would be endorsed by almost anyone. The problem in each case is to follow through in a manner that, that demonstrates genuine commitment to them. Career people in government seek and need the policy direction of presidential appointees. 
they know that the president and the vice president who serves with him are the only <coughs> elected officials in the executive branch and that they were elected to implement <coughs> the policies that they presented to the people of the United States during the course of their campaigns. Conversely, on the other hand, a political appointee, in order effectively to be able to implement the basic policies of the president, needs to be able to call upon and should welcome the opportunity to take advantage of the knowledge, experience, and institutional <coughs> memory embodied in the career services. All too often, political appointees have come into office with an attitude of suspicion toward the career services. Somebody somewhere told them that the career services have an agenda of their own and are only looking for the opportunity to put it over on the unsuspecting <coughs> political people who come in from somewhere altogether too innocent of the, of the machinations of these people. In fact, of course, uh, the career people recognize that, that they cannot bring to bear the value of their knowledge and experience except in a context in which clear leadership is given to them. And I will come a little later on, Mr. Chairman, to one of the problems intrinsic to the communication of, of clear leadership. In addition to the role of reflecting the president's policies, political appointees uh, have the advantage of coming into government with fresh ideas and, and, and new energy. Uh, the, all government departments and agencies benefit from the, the infusion of, of uh, these contributions. But when it comes to the actual management of a government agency, the characteristics that are manifest in the best political appointees are precisely those found in the best career managers also. Political appointees, like career managers, should have leadership abilities, managerial competence, substantive expertise, and, and above all, an appreciation for the constitutional context within which the executive branch operates. Mr. Chairman, there is no greater deterrent to effectiveness in any organization or a more serious contributor to the loss of a sense of purpose than poor leadership and management and the perception that managerial competence, career or political does not measure up. The record in this hearing is full of examples uh, of that precise breakdown, and this is the kind of thing, Mr. Chairman, that we would like to cull from the record and, and uh, cite in support of these, this general proposition. This hearing confirms the recommendation of the task force on relation between political appointees and career executives to the effect that there should be established explicit criteria for the qualifications of people nominated for each political position, and that these criteria emphasize managerial experience and substantive experience, as well as loyalty and philosophical compatibility with the president. To put it the other way around, Mr. Chairman, Loyalty and philosophical compatibility with the president are no substitute for managerial experience and substantive knowledge. And where those are all that are to be found, the result is a, is, can be quite apart from any venality or bad motivation, the very sort of breakdown that has been illustrated over and over again by the testimony submitted to this subcommittee. Further, our task force 
recommends the establishment of qualifications review boards similar to those used by the Office of Personnel Management to fill career SES positions. This, we believe, is needed in order to ensure that political appointees have at least adequate qualification for the positions to which they will be appointed. It would be interesting, Mr. Chairman, to, to take uh, the resumes of some of the key people who have figured in these hearings, uh, particularly those whose roles uh, have been shown to be least effective or most destructive, and uh, see what degree of knowledge and background they brought to those positions. Third, we recommend that the qualifications of individuals appointed to Schedule C positions which uh, are accepted from competitive appointment criteria because of the confidentiality of their duties, should be the same as those of career employees with similar duties and grade levels. In other words, uh, the, the consideration of confidentiality and the personal relationship uh, involved in such a position may justify accepting it from the career service. They do not justify uh, the, uh, an absence of, of capacity to do the job. Second consideration, the basic consideration that I cited earlier is that career professionals must have a place at the table Again, uh, the, the record before this subcommittee is full of instances in which uh, career people uh, were excluded, ignored, or uh, worst of all, uh, overridden in situations in which uh, they specifically called attention to what they believe to be wrong. This raises uh, the question touched on by Mr. Weiss uh, of how uh, career people can affirmatively be encouraged to stand up to political appointees in those situations. A whistleblowing statute is, is, not, is not the answer to most such situations. One is dealing often with, with uh, a situation of pervasive pressure in which uh, people who have been around in a government agency for a long time uh, may feel a tendency simply to duck and let the situation blow over in the belief that there's nothing that really can be done at the moment. Uh, that is not an easy kind of problem to deal with, and uh, but I think it is one that that, uh, that is also pointed up by the record before this subcommittee. As this subcommittee has seen, in circumstances in which partisan political appointees take their roles with an attitude of suspicion toward the career services, the result can be to exclude the, the career executives from policy discussions in fear of a perceived threat to the policy development process. Uh, that I, I cannot resist, Mr. Chairman, uh, pointing out is, is uh, probably one of the dumbest things that a political manager can do. If there's anything that leads to, to a lack of, of a sense of commitment, uh, even uh, to uh, a uh, sort of perverse tendency to resist policy direction, and to uh, leakage with the aim of undercutting political appointees, it is just such exclusion of the career people. Uh, I, when I came at HEW in 1970, for example, the, there was a situation of, of considerably 
damaged morale, including backbiting and leaking. First thing I did was to pass out the word that in any meeting where a policy issue was to be discussed in which a, any person in the department, however junior, had had a role in the development of the recommendation submitted by a, a component of the department, I wanted those people present so they could hear themselves what were the considerations being put forward by others who did not necessarily agree with their own boss in order that they would be exposed to the, the, the difficulty that often is associated with weighing closely balanced competing interests and concerns. In, in HUD itself, uh, the degree to which partisanship in the and political influence in the pejorative sense of the word political uh, existed was pointed up in a study conducted by Mr. Stephen Stair at the University of California during the period covered by these hearings. He asked top executive branch officials to what extent they believed that policy decisions were made in their organizations on the basis of improper political influence. At HUD, 40.5 percent of the respondents said that they believed the decisions were being made uh, on a predominantly political basis in that sense of the term within their immediate offices and almost 75 percent believed such criteria were used in department level policy decisions. Those figures <coughs> are con contrasted with the responses of employees at the FAA who uh, only 7.7 percent of whom believed such uh, improper use of political pressure existed. And uh, the USGS, where the percentage was only 3.3 percent. The third consideration I mentioned has to do with the, the Problems intrinsic to excessive layers of political management. I said I would re I return to this point when I touched on the, the importance of clear political leadership. Ironically, the tendency in recent years has been to believe that the way to, to develop greater responsiveness of the career services to political leadership is to, is to appoint more political appointees. The result tends to be the precise opposite. The mere numbers of people uh, holding political appointments means that there is a greater chance that some of them won't really get the message. In any event, uh, there are more people attempting to deliver that message to the career service, uh, often, often in, a, in a competing and overlapping manner, and in the case specifically of HUD through the use of rump groups, not even occupying a line role, and yet delivering communication to the career services more or less parallel to and, and often in conflict with the, the uh, leadership or directives uh, delivered through uh, the line managers. But uh, in addition to all that, there is the problem of layering that exists when there are too many political appointees interposed between the top leadership of the department and the career services. This is a factor bearing on our recommendation for the reduction in the number of political appointees uh, that, uh, that 
really uh, totally sidesteps the question of, of what the appropriate total number should be in some sort of abstract sense. It's a matter that really can be addressed only by looking at the table of organization of particular departments and agencies and seeing how many layers there are. If there are too many, you can then be sure that the result will be less effective political leadership, not otherwise, and less effective implementation of presidential policies by, by <coughs> career people who never get the message clearly in the first place and who do, who do not have the opportunity adequately to communicate themselves with the political managers who should be listening to what they have to say, drawing on their own knowledge and experience. Uh, this again is a matter that uh, is pointed up at various stages of these hearings and is the sort of thing I mentioned earlier when uh, I spoke of the, the uh, annotated version of this testimony. I just want to make one uh, final point uh, because I think the rest of, of uh, what I might otherwise say is adequately covered in the statement. This has to do with the, the opportunities of career people. Nothing can be more demoralizing to people who have spent their lives in a career service hoping that, that doing a good job, demonstration of ability and dedication will in due course give them the opportunity to, to rise to positions of major responsibility in the organization. When uh, too many political appointees uh, are moved in to positions that have up to then been viewed as open to the career services, the effect can, of course, be immediately demoralizing. Uh, in those circumstances, if the political appointees who are moved into those positions also lack adequate qualifications for the role, if they are not people capable of the kind of, of leadership that uh, I have been talking about, the <coughs> result, of course, is doubly demoralizing. Whatever may be the, the uh, absolute uh, level of or rather proportion among the political appointees in a given agency, it is clearly important that uh, this structure be stabilized. Uh, I've served uh, now altogether in four different jobs over 20 years in the State Department and uh, as uh, Ambassador Lingen uh, could testify even more forcefully, uh, one of the most troublesome problems in that ser service is the, is the fluctuation uh, from administration to administration in the ratio of, of uh, non-career uh, ambassadorial appointees. It is important in the interest of the development of the highest quality career services of the United States that, that the uh, there be established a stable structure, including, for example, a clear understanding as to the, what I believe should be the small fraction in, in the number of, of political appointees uh, who uh, are appointed to the position of Deputy <laughs> Assistant Secretary. Uh, in short, Mr. Chairman, the uh, the hearing that you and the members of this subcommittee has been conducting uh, is one that uh, I think uh, has performed a very significant service and uh, one whose contributions I think will have a, a ripple effect throughout the federal government for a very long time to come. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Thank Whether you. Whether you want to ask questions now or to, uh, uh, perhaps we well, ask Mr. Siciliano. Let me first thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And while I'm sure all three of our 
guests know this, so I want to apologize for a brief absence, but we have a vote going on on the floor, and I thought we should continue the hearing, and my colleagues will return in just We're well, always reminded, Mr. Chairman, every time I come to the Hill that, that uh, members of Congress are working for the American people. Well, we, we like to think so. We like to think so, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, uh, I think we will ask the questions after all three of you have made your opening remarks, and we will now be very pleased to hear from, uh, from Mr. Siciliano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I am pleased to add my comments to those that have been expressed by my colleague, Elliot Richardson, uh, an old friend, frankly, who dates back to 1953 when we were both very young uh, assistant secretaries at that time in the Eisenhower administration. He has been, as usual, so beautifully articulate about the uh, problems, the relationships, both the successful and unsuccessful relationships between career federal officials and political appointees. As was indicated, I have uh, been the chairman of the Committee on Recruitment and Retention of the National Commission on the Public Service. And so we have been focusing on a somewhat different aspect of the federal service, public service, namely how do you get good people into the service, and once they are there, how do you continue to keep them in, uh, which involves many, many things such as training and so on. As was indicated in your opening remarks, Mr. Chairman, I did happen to have a very fortunate experience in that I served as the special assistant to President Eisenhower for a two-year period, slightly more, for personnel management. And many people don't realize that that was a job that he created by executive order. Uh, he was very concerned personally that the members of the career service of government be protected <laughs> from political pressures. And so there was issued by Mr. Eisenhower uh, in September of 1957 an executive order which continued throughout his service, uh, the remaining part of his service as president. It subsequently was rescinded uh, by President Kennedy afterwards. Now what was this executive order all about? He, it carefully spelled out duties and responsibilities of the special assistant to the president and I might say parenthetically that was a title that was very carefully used in those days. There were only six special assistants and all were told that they were to have a passion for anonymity, which in turn was a copy from uh, the Brownlow Commission report in the 1930s. Would you happen to know, sir, how many special assistants there are now to the president? There, the title assistant to the president, yes. whether they're special assistant or assistant to the yes. president, is, I don't know the exact number, but it must be in the dozens. There maybe, were only it should, maybe it should be changed to not so special assistant yes. to the president. This is part of what I intended to get to, which is this uh, excessive overlayering of positions that uh, Mr. Richardson talked about, not only in the executive branch, but it certainly has now, as we know, gone to the White House. It has been, by the way, this particular progression is not anything new. It really began in earnest, if you want to be historical about it, uh, beginning following President Eisenhower's tenure. And it has only been added to and added to and added to as the years have passed by successive presidents. And the same thing holds true with the other aspect of excessive overlayering, uh, namely the executive branch. Uh, I can go back to the time of 1953 when I was appointed an assistant secretary of labor, and at that time there were three politically appointed assistant secretaries of labor. There was an undersecretary, the number two position, and then of course there was the secretary of labor. Today uh, the uh, labor department has something like uh, ten uh, positions in the undersecretary level and uh, a dozen or so positions in the uh, assistant secretary level. 
I have to backtrack on that. I'm not sure that the 10 number is correct. I'd rather talk about the Commerce Department, which I am much more familiar with today. When I left the Commerce Department as Undersecretary in 1971, there was one Undersecretary. That position is now called Deputy Secretary. It is the number two position. Uh, today, uh, 19 years later, there are six Undersecretaries and there are 10 Assistant Secretaries in addition to a number of other major positions such as Chief Scientist, Chief Economist, all of these are politically appointed positions. But more important than just the presidentially appointed positions confirmed by the Senate is the structure somewhat below that group. And now I'm referring to the positions of Deputy Undersecretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary. These at one time were the ultimate that a career civil servant could reach. This is the position that he could aspire to. Now those positions almost universally are, president, are politically appointed positions, the Deputy Assistant Secretary. The Deputy Assistant Secretary position, the first one was created in 1953. Uh, actually, it was in the Department of Labor where I was then serving. The first deputy undersecretary was created also in the Department of Labor about 1956. I can well recall that when these positions were created and they were filled with career people, this was regarded with great happiness uh, by the career civil servant. Uh, the Washington Post in those days even editorialized on how this was the epitome for the career civil servant, this kind of position, Deputy Assistant Secretary and Deputy Undersecretary. Needless to say, that's no longer the case. These are political jobs. Not these are not confirmed by the U.S. Senate, but they are political jobs. So we've seen this very excessive structuring without any uh, uh, corresponding increase in the magnitude of the responsibilities of the department. This would be the natural answer. You would say, yes, but doesn't that department have much more to do than they did 19 years ago or, and our memory goes back to the 50s, 37 years ago? The answer is yes, of course, there has been some change and new additions, particularly in the Department of Labor, not so much in the Department of Commerce, the two departments that I'm familiar with. But nevertheless, not in any sense commensurate with what has happened politically that you now have this great profusion of politically appointed people. This then moves to the, the point that uh, Elliot Richardson was talking about, which is the, the question of communication between the people at the top and those who are the career civil servants who are designed to carry out the functions of, of the laws as well as of their political superiors. This excessive kind of restructuring, overstructuring, I call it, makes it very difficult for communication to be easy and constant between the supervisors and their, their politically appointed bosses. Uh, I think that testimony before this sub subcommittee has shown that some of the problems at HUD appear to have been uh, attributable to this loss of this sense of common purpose, this trust, this respect that has always been the essence of successful relationships between the career civil servant and the political appointee. So I would say that we must look at, and our uh, Leadership in America report certainly touches on this theme and it does it, uh, as, as Elliot Richardson has indicated in that chapter that he was responsible primarily for, with respect to increases in the numbers of political appointees and the placement of appointees in lower positions in the department and agencies. There isn't any doubt in my mind, and I think our report says that, that this excessive type of restructuring, overstructuring, uh, can only lead to the kind of uh, unfortunate uh, happenstance that we've seen in, in your hearings that have been brought out so clearly here. I think that, in essence, basically is what I'm trying to say, and I think at that point I will conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Siciliano. I'm very pleased to call on uh, Ambassador Bruce Langan, who after a most distinguished diplomatic career has assumed uh, the role of executive career of the National Commission on Public Service. We remember 
uh, your uh, uh, outstanding performance under most trying circumstances during the uh, takeover of our embassy in Tehran. And uh, on behalf of the subcommittee, I want to welcome you to this hearing, Ambassador Langan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that statement. I had a lot of help. Let me make that clear at the yes. time. I don't have a prepared statement. I've got a couple of notes. Let me just make them. I'm here in the best tradition of the career service this morning in support of my political leadership, if you will, in support of two highly respected and able members of the Volcker Commission who sit to my right. But from that vantage point, <coughs> let me simply corroborate what they have said about the career service this morning. I think I can say for all of my colleagues in the career service of government at all levels that we, re we welcome that we respect strong, quality-driven political leadership. We expect it. <coughs> we want it. We regret when it's not there. And that reflects adversely on all of us in the career service of government. I can't speak for HUD. I don't know that agency. But I have no doubt that that sentiment is felt there by my career former career colleagues as well. I've retired from active duty. In the Foreign Service, in the Department of State, let me make it clear that we there as well, I know from my colleagues, welcome and seek strong political leadership. It keeps us on our toes. It brings in new ideas. We welcome that. And in the context of political appointments as ambassadors, I have to simply corroborate, however, what Elliot has, <coughs> has said. There is a number that uh, causes some problems when it becomes successive. I gather from my colleagues that the ratio now of political appointees as versus career as chief submission is beginning to go back to the <coughs> traditional figure of roughly two career to one political. And that, of course, I welcome and we welcome. But in the career service, in the Foreign Service and in the Department of State, that service wants to be acknowledged. It wants to be a part of the action. It wants to make a contribution, both to policy as well as to process. We want a place at the table of the kind that I've been given this morning, if you will. When we don't sense we're getting that in the career service, either because of excessive numbers of political appointees, or worse, sometimes because of placement, then we regret it. And the political leadership, if that takes place, risks losing what the career service can provide, experience, institutional memory, and not least, enthusiasm on the job. And if I could cite the Department of State today, I'm not on active duty, but I sense from my contacts and my colleagues there, that while there is the highest respect for the quality and the strength of the present political leadership of that department, and if I may, may inject my own respect for the quality of the leadership in the department on issues affecting the Middle East today, there is also, I sense, a fairly widespread feeling among my colleagues of being out of the loop of not being a part of the action, not being important players. And if that is so, and the fact that there are today, I am told, a total of 48 political appointees, deputy assistant secretary and above, when I came into the Foreign Service in the late 40s, early 50s, I think we could count that number on one hand. If that is so, if that number is there of that degree, then that department, I think, like others, risks not utilizing to the fullest the career expertise and institutional memory and enthusiasm that is there waiting to be put in place. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lang. And I'd like to begin uh, with a general question, gentlemen, <coughs> beginning with uh, Ambassador Richardson. Um, several of the individuals who have been called before this subcommittee 
Deborah Dean, Hunter Cushing, Joseph Strauss, were appointed to extremely powerful high-level positions, yet they lacked any substantive expertise in housing programs. Uh, a large number of people appointed to ambassadorial position during uh, last year didn't have a clue about the countries they were appointed to. As a matter of fact, as you probably know, I have legislation calling for significantly, some say drastically changing the percentage of career ambassadors and political appointees. Uh, what realistic steps do you think can be taken to assure some substantive professional experience on the part of political appointees, whether at HUD or in the U.S. Foreign Service as, as ambassadors? Uh, Ambassador Richardson, would you care to, to start on this? <coughs> I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think this is a central issue. Uh, I mentioned earlier... I, I appreciate that. If you <coughs> I mentioned earlier two of the recommendations of uh, yes. our task force for the National Commission of the Public Service, which uh, addressed this question. One is that the qualifications for particular positions open to presidential appointment uh, be explicitly spelled out <coughs> and that uh, among them be included managerial experience as well as substantive experience in the area of the job. If the, we think that if the if you had what amounted in effect to a sort of a thumbnail job description like the prune books, uh, and then uh, this would, and this were made in effect official, it would be harder then to, to justify appointees who didn't meet these explicitly adopted qualifications. The uh, related recommendation we made was that, that uh, similar uh, statements of qualification be uh, spelled out for uh, the uh, non-career SES positions and that there be established qualification review boards uh, for this purpose. Um, the uh, You, you made a, a uh, you asked what <coughs> realistic measures, I think these, these two would, uh, <coughs> would make a significant difference, Mr. Chairman. As to, as to ambassadorial appointees, <coughs> I was one of the uh, organizers and original members of the American Academy of Diplomacy that was created for the specific purpose of a trying, trying to address this question. There are difficulties intrinsic to it that I, I won't elaborate on now, but one thing that we have done um, in recent years in, for each ambassadorial position is to submit to the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations a statement of what the American Academy of Diplomacy believes to be the, the uh, qualifications of knowledge and experience appropriate to a given ambassadorial post. But weren't those statements <coughs> basically ignored, Mr. Ambassador, without mentioning names or countries? One of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe uh, uh, had a political appointee who arrived at the spot about a week before all hell broke loose for the first time in his life. And, uh, and the degree to which the complexity of the situation would have called for an enormously sensitive awareness of all of the nuances and ramifications and players that were involved in that 
horrendous uh, revolutionary upheaval were all lacking. And, uh, and the individual, uh, in fact, uh, was, a, uh, was a drag on the performance of the embassy rather than a leader under the most difficult of circumstances. Exactly so, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> we, some members of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations have, have uh, been glad to receive these papers that we've submitted to them. It'd be hard to say how much uh, impact they have had. Uh, but they do point up the problem, and if, if they could be taken more seriously, and not necessarily as they originate from us, but as a way of, again, spelling out what qualities are needed, this could have an influence. I saw the obverse of the kind of example you just cited in Bulgaria when I was in uh, the Philippines at the end of November of last year. And uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, our ambassador there, Nicholas Platt, under great pressure uh, and, and uh, situ a situation of, of enormous urgency in, in addressing the situation quickly, uh, made some recommendations that were followed through at the Pennsylvania Avenue end with comparable uh, efficiency. But I think if he had not been there, uh, the outcome could have been quite different. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think uh, Bruce Langan uh, or any of us who have been exposed to the foreign policy process would, <coughs> would urge uh, that all ambassadorial appointments go to career appointees, That's as correct. they do in many other governments, for all practical purposes. But to the extent that they don't, uh, clearly there should be uh, spelled out and, yeah. and observed the highest possible qualifications. But on the there two points here, Mr. Ambassador, and I'd like uh, Mr. Siciliano and, and, and Mr. Langan to comment also. One is that you minimally wish to ensure a level of competence and preparation and expertise. But the other aspect is that career people ought to be able to look forward to capping their career with a reasonably high level position within the civil service having devoted their lifetime to public service. So it seems to me that it is not unreasonable to establish categories where only career people should serve. And with respect to ambassadorial appointments, would it not make sense to establish a percentage that yes. mm. is yeah. guaranteed to career appointees? Yes. Stability is important. And, and I think it's also true that some kinds of positions could, not necessarily by statute or rigidly, but <coughs> Mr. Siciliano referred to a number of the positions that have, have been opened up to political appointment, many of which used to be regarded as totally unpolitical, not in the sense that they were available only to career people, but that they were available only to the people with the highest prof possible professional and technical qualifications in their field, director of the Bureau of Standards, for example. Mr. Siciliano. Yes, well, just to follow up a little bit, to somewhat separate the uh, diplomatic, the Foreign Service from the domestic side. Yes. Uh, the Foreign Service and the ambassadorial category there has ranged from as much as 70 percent, which is what I think the goal is uh, of career ambassadors, to 30 percent uh, politically appointed. And that ratio seems to be a, a fairly decent one. And then sometimes when you get beyond that, you get to as much as 40 or so percent that's politically appointed, you, you start to run into problems. I think... But aren't uh, those figures misleading? Yes, because they the are. Career because career people are getting yes, the little uh, embassies in third world countries. Exactly. And political people are getting the plums in Paris yeah, exactly. and London and Rome. Right. Yeah. And, that's uh, traditionally uh, always been uh, very and, true. Uh, so there is really a very... 
the, the purely statistical comparison, it seems to me, obfuscates the issue because... Uh, no, I, I certainly agree with that. Uh, that the key, uh, the, the glamour posts, as they call them, uh, are usually politically some appointed. The, and, uh, it's fair to say, though, Mr. Chairman, some of the glamour posts are also the least demanding. Least, least demanding, yes. Well, uh, we have in, in Elliot Richardson a person who had a glamour post but who was also eminently qualified at the Court of St. James. You were lucky. You well, know, Elliot Richardson is sort of uh, 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 exhibit uh, number one of, uh, of uh, an outstanding appointment outside yes, of yeah. the career service. But no, none of us is worried about uh, the Elliot no, Richardson's I, being no, appointed. I would, I would like to post. focus a bit, Mr. Chairman, on the domestic side. Right. The, the, uh, the kind of thing that your committee has done so well and unfortunate for the individuals so often in, in question, but nevertheless it has brought out the lack of qualification uh, in the Deputy Assistant Secretary category. But I also might point out a different one that I haven't even touched on, which is the Assistant 2 category. The Special Assistant or Executive Assistant, very often that position which is totally outside of the career civil service, has enormous power. We because, had, we had that yes, in our Yes, I, I know you have, and that's why I'm just recalling it, because that is not only true in the HUD situation, but it's true in other executive branches. Very often, a political appointed executive, whether he is an assistant secretary or an undersecretary, or the secretary himself uh, or herself, uh, might have an executive assistant who is given extraordinary kinds of authority to uh, carry out, often of a political nature. Uh, we have seen the categories that used to exist, the so-called Schedule A, Schedule B, Schedule C. Uh, each of these categories are still in effect, but somewhere in Nether Netherland is the Executive Assistant Special Assistant category. Uh, the, the job that requires, that's a Schedule C, basically, uh, though that's so-called policy and confidential, but you have to question whether a chauffeur should be a Schedule C, but he often is. So you, the only, to get back to your basic question, though, uh, how, do you, how do you insist on qualification? It's unfortunate that there is no way short of law that would make it necessary to have uh, put these people in, in a category com uh, comparable to the competitive civil service. Uh, we now see the competitive civil service only accounting for something like 15 percent of the people coming into the public service today are so-called competition, old civil service examination types. Uh, the majority are coming, coming in now under special authority. There are good reasons for this. I don't mean to cr criticize it, but because we've seen a breakdown of the original examination in 1982, which was discarded as being discriminatory, the so-called PACE examination. And as a result, uh, the agencies have been given special hiring authorities, which they are using to the fullest. And so that the so-called old civil service competitive exam is not bringing in to uh, young people, at least, uh, uh, under the competitive system, much more than 15 percent. Ambassador Langan. Well, I think it's all been said. Uh, I would certainly agree with Elliot Richardson's uh, observation that the Foreign Service doesn't expect every to have access to every uh, chief of mission post abroad. We have traditionally long accepted uh, the traditional roughly 70-30 figure. Uh, and that was out of balance and went out of balance in recent years. My impression is that it's falling back into rough balance. Uh, in terms of, uh, you mentioned that, uh, and I think Elliot did as well, that the career foreign service, obviously all members of it aspire. That's their aspiration. They would love each and every one of us. We know we can't all of us be to be chief of mission. That's the ultimate in recognition. That's the ultimate in participation. That's the ultimate in respect. Uh, that's what hurts when it becomes something like 65-35 uh, uh, or 60-40, which it was getting in recent years. Not only have we seen um, some of the, we've also seen in that context some of the smaller posts go political. And that, to me, makes no sense in terms of building a foreign service 
with experience and respect. Several of the chiefs of mission in the Gulf states, for example, in the Middle East, have recently been, have become political. I see no need for that. I think Iceland has been political, a small post that one can aspire to. That should not be necessary. You spoke, sir, as well of your own interest in limiting the number of uh, deputy assistant secretary slots uh, government-wide, I assume you're speaking of. I don't know that that's going to be feasible. I believe I, I am correct in my understanding that the legislation establishing the most recent uh, government department, the Department of Veterans Affairs, has within it a built-in limitation on the number uh, of political deputy assistant secretary slots. I certainly, if that is the case, that is certainly welcome, I would think, within that uh, Department of Government. I mentioned, sir, that the total number of political appointees now in the Department of State um, at the Dis Deputy Assistant Secretary level and above is 48. And I mentioned that that compares to what I knew when I came into the Foreign Service as a number that I could easily count on one hand, I believe. That strikes me as too high. Um, that's out of a total, of course, of a growing department, a much larger department than when I came into the Foreign Service. We're a different country today with per interests that are perceived a little differently. And we've required, apparently, that much bigger a Department of State, although there, I think, too, there must be a limit to what we do in terms of expanding uh, the place. I suspect uh, it would be very difficult in this administration, however, sir, uh, or in any other, to limit by law, by legislation, the number, specifically government-wide, of deputy assistant secretaries or of ambassadors from the so political service So your position is that the establishment of meaningful criteria for Would qualifications be. is a more realistic route that than numerical than numerical. That's limits. essential, and it should be there, and I think that is realistic. Right. Hopefully realistic, at least more so more realistic. than numbering. Right, Congressman Lukens. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. I had one word to please to supplement what Mr. Siliano said about ex executive assistants or special assistants. To the Would secretary. you pull the mic closer yeah. to you, uh, Ambassador Richards? Okay. The it needs to be emphasized that at the end of the day, there's no substitute for leadership at the top. A, the, a position like that of principal assistant to a agency or department head is analogous to the position of chief of staff for the president. The, the post can be extremely valuable and constructive, provided that everyone with whom the chief of staff or the special assistant deals can have confidence that the person in that position <coughs> accurately and faithfully reflects the views of his principal and that he will say so when he doesn't know these views. The, the problem arises where you have people who, who begin to behave as if they were running a fiefdom of their own. And it would appear that exactly that problem did, in fact, arise in HUD. Thank you very much. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I find very little to follow up on because I think we all agree with the basic parameters with which to approach the problem. So I'd like to examine, if I, um, in, in real detail, a couple of the suggestions. If I may oversimplify uh, the testimony thus far, you gentlemen are all concerned about the growth in numbers, first of all, in these uh, categories. Secondly, secondly, about the continued lack of full utilization of the professional or career appointment category in these same jobs. And thirdly, the absence of any meaningful limit in the application of numbers or, or opportunities for upward mobility to the professionals, specifically. I'd like to address this from this, from this standpoint. I am not nearly as concerned about 
the percentages, although I certainly uh, agree with the uh, what Mr. Langen and <coughs> Ambassador Langen has referred to as uh, probably a, a working percentage, 70, 30, as I am about qualifications. I'm very concerned about qualifications. I'd like to throw my first specific question out in micromanagement to the ambassador. Would it not be of some assistance in maintaining the professional approach to ambassadorial appointments if we simply required a, uh, I think five is the highest category of um, spoken proficiency and written proficiency, a five, five in the language of the country to which they're going? Would that not be in, in most countries other than English, that would certainly uh, uh, eliminate a great many of the appointments that we've had who are maybe three and four and taking the language but simply not fluent and they're learning on government time at government expense? Well, it would be ideal if it could happen. I'm afraid we're up against the fact that uh, we are Americans who are damn poor about learning second languages across the board. Uh, I, if you set that high a figure, I'm afraid you would exclude almost everyone. Not necessarily, but uh, you'd run that risk. I think what you say, however, simply emphasizes the importance of language, of a capacity to speak the language in the country to which you are accredited. Of course, there must be that degree of competence to the extent that we can get it. If you could set a figure of three plus or four, that seems a little more realistic. But to apply that across the board and expect every ambassador to have that in place at a given time, I think that probably would rather be rather difficult. You might need someone who is a particularly uh, adept uh, manager, uh, capable of coping with a particularly <coughs> stressful scene that may not necessarily have that language at hand. If that is the case, obviously, the, it emphasizes, again, emphasizes the importance of language competence down through the ranks. That's where it really matters. As an aside, I, I personally speak three and, and uh, I'm fairly fluent in a couple of others, but I'm taking my fifth right now, uh, five mornings a week. And um, while I don't mean to be uh, self-congratulatory, the point is that we have a growing awareness among our younger generation, I think, on language, uh, about languages that I did not at all sense when I was growing up. In fact, a person like languages in my high school is considered a little bit different, a little bit weird. I know our chairman, of course, being born in another country, his English always impresses me, the fluency and the accuracy with which he's able to adequately describe things uh, is mind-boggling, if you'll permit. Now, let me move to... I hope you're right. There is that move trend. To another category. And this is the general category of qualifications for appointments to these higher categories. It seems to me that the qualifications are the key, and that if we had held any kind of accountability for qualifications and for experience, at least on paper, to these key positions in HUD, this whole mess would yeah. never have occurred. Would you comment on that basic general approach that if we simply, as um, Ambassador Richardson or Mr. Richardson already mentioned, formally uh, legalize the requirements in the plum book? We only have requirements, they just simply are not adhered to all the time. Uh, either one of you gentlemen, both actually. I, I would, would like to talk about that a bit. Uh, it's true that I've spent perhaps a little too much time uh, talking numbers and, uh, and positions. Uh, the excessive uh, overstructuring that has occurred in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Let me uh, rush to assure the gentleman, I am very grateful for the figures you have furnished, and I think you've not spent yeah. too much time on them. I'm simply investigating but another wanna, alternative at this time. But to how to meet this situation is, there are two things. One is that we should still make it possible for the career civil servant to aspire to a deputy assistant secretaryship. That's basically what I was trying to say. But for those who are not career civil service and who are brought in from the uh, outside, from the private sector, uh, into those positions, I think it's absolutely essential that qualifications be set up that would say that a person who is coming into, a, say, a, a technical uh, labor department or a uh, commerce department position, I'm, as you notice, talking only about two departments that I've served in, a total of seven, almost seven years, uh, it, it would say to, to me at least that those persons should have that kind of specific relevant education and experience. Sometimes the experiences might be uh, minimal, but at least if they've had an education that led to that particular position. We've seen, uh, I wouldn't even pretend, I, I happened to be, when I was the a deputy, or uh, as, as it was then called, the Undersecretary of Commerce, uh, we had to fill the position of the director of the Bureau of Standards, the one that Elliot Richardson referred to. We didn't even look anywhere except 
uh, in a very narrow band of highly qualified, skilled researchers, uh, PhDs, and uh, even at that, I have to tell you, that we had difficulty because that was a presidentially appointed position. And the particular person we chose at that time, this is going back to 1970 now, happened to have a different political persuasion than, uh, the, than was in the administration. I was a Republican and Mr. Nixon was president. Uh, we did have some difficulty getting him cleared because he happened not to be a registered Republican. But nevertheless, the, the sanity of the thing was so persuasive that you had to have in the Bureau of Standards a person of, the, of real qualifications that he was appointed and he was uh, uh, successfully confirmed. Mr. Richardson, would you mind commenting on that? Or, or Mr. Langan again, I don't care. Any additional comments on that? I have one additional route, Mr. Chairman, I would like to pursue. I, I really don't like the approach that would involve quotas or limits, but I understand that there should be some understanding that some limits such as 70-30 should not, or 60-40, uh, it should not be approached, that something near 70-30 should, should uh, apply. And, and I think that's sensible and that's practicable and it's a good tool for a manager to use. The problem is in this area with numbers, and I want to draw upon my personal experience with the house in which I have the privilege to serve. When I first came here as a staffer, uh, we only had, well, we only had about 50 subcommittees and one-fifth of the staff of today's Congress. So the growth in government has been phenomenal. And, and I think, the, I just want to put in perspective and give it a comparison, the growth in our own House and the Senate staff has been uh, no less um, grandiose than the, than the growth in the executive branch. However, my question would be, how do we best approach it, given the fact that I think members of Congress and congressional leadership are not going to willingly cut uh, here to any great extent. The executive branch is going to fight cuts in its own manpower selectivity. And with this special hiring, hiring authority to which you made reference earlier, there is now an additional power that they can use to continue hiring in spite of the fact everyone has kind of said back in 82 and that was ruled, the uh, PACE test pace was ruled exam, yeah. uh, out, that we should slow down. We haven't actually slowed down, we've increased the pace, if you'll forgive the pun. So, how do we approach this in terms of common sense reemerging in all our houses? I mean, how do we cut government that has not been cut significantly and certainly not permanently in 50 years? <coughs> May I... Uh make a couple of observations in that, those questions, Mr. Lukens. First of all, I think uh, it needs to be recognized that, that there has been an enormous increase in the demands placed upon government. Uh, looking back over a very long period, uh, it's apparent that uh, in the context, for example, of human services, uh, there have emerged a whole array of problems that are either new or were largely ignored. I won't elaborate, uh, take a little, but then there are areas in which government has taken initiatives, properly so, that were totally free of government intervention only 20 or 30 years ago. I remember, for example, visiting the Robert A. Taft Sanitary Engineering Center on the Ohio River uh, in 1957. They showed me <coughs> vials of viscous fluid distilled from the Ohio and the Monongahela rivers. There was no federal legislation in the field of environmental protection at all in those days. Today, we are confronting uh, problems of teenage pregnancy, rampant drug abuse, you know the, the list. I've written about this before in connection with the role of the National Commission of the Public Service as it bears on the need for 
<coughs> the highest possible qualifications of people in government. The, the <coughs> complexity increases, I would say this dogmatically, <coughs> as a function of <coughs> the interaction of a whole series <coughs> of, the, of exponential changes. The result is that complexity, in, complexity increases faster than any of them. And what you're seeing, in part, in the hypertrophy of congressional staffs is a response to that. The number of, of problems that are addressed on the Hill today is vastly larger than when I served as a legislative assistant for the then senior senator from Massachusetts in 53-4. Uh, and the, the disarray of problems is thrust also on the executive branch. Uh, and one of the reasons for the increases in the, the number of these political appointees, it's fair to say, is because the political choices that need to be made among ever more difficult competing claims has increased. So uh, <coughs> the second point I'd like to make has to do with qualifications. I, while I believe that we should encourage the, the spelling out of qualifications along the lines as to which I've earlier testified, I don't think this should be rigidified to the point where what we have done in the context of political appointments is, is, a, is to introduce a, a whole new uh, requirement of credentialism, which uh, tends to get in the way much of the time in areas <coughs> where outside of government, where uh, occupations are divided up the way the craft unions used to be divided up. I would like to I, I, thank the gentleman for his statement, and, and I pretty tell and, uh, you, in wrapping up, just because uh, uh, I'm sure the other members would like to participate in this too, if you forgive me, uh, very quickly that uh, I, I too share a great admiration and for the need and the growth of government. The question now is that we are so large, how we can best manage that growth or hopefully uh, the, the diminution of our uh, necessary growth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank my colleague, and uh, before turning to, to the rest of our uh, uh, colleagues on the panel, let me just indicate we have two additional panels uh, this morning, and uh, uh, we hope to finish before uh, 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 the, the day is over. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn to Congressman Martinez. Uh, <laughs> Let me say that there's never enough time at these hearings to really get into an in-depth discussion with <coughs> the kinds of problems that exist uh, when you have uh, political appointees who are really there for policy reasons and then there is that conflict between policy and administration or policy versus the law. Uh, in HUD we saw a policy uh, that subverted the law, that said ignored the law, it just said hey. It doesn't exist as far as we want to do the things we want to do. And, and that leads to the, the inherent conflict that I believe exists between uh, political appointees and career appointees. You know, career appointee generally feels that based on his technical experience, knowledge, and et cetera, he probably can make a better decision, and he maybe can. The only thing is that those technical decisions don't always respond to the community needs. And the differing situations that are uh, that arise in the communities. Uh, subsequently, political decisions, too, uh, uh, in the case of HUD already, don't always regard the letter of the law. And so there's that constant conflict that you have that somehow we've got to resolve. I think that uh, your recommendations on cutting back the number is probably a good one. I'm not too sure it's a good one, because I, I like to believe that elected officials were given a responsibility to oversee the bureaucracies. You know, a colleague of ours, Pat Williams, said on the floor one time, and I've been studying it ever since, he said, never underestimate the power of the bureaucracy. Well, anybody that has given, been given the ability to make a decision has power. There's no doubt about it. And so you want to be able to control that power so that it be, don't become abusive. We didn't in the case of HUD, and it became abusive. And, and like I say, cutting back the numbers sounds like a good idea. It may be good, a good idea, but, you know, they're put there, those people, by an elected official. And that elected official is made responsible for the ultimate outcome of his policies. 
And that's why we have the electoral process. If people don't like the outcome of his policies, they elect someone else. And so it goes on and on. But the point I'm getting at is that if you, if you don't necessarily cut back the number then, then maybe the other aspect of your report that indicates delineating the duties and responsibilities so that always clearly, because it's very difficult. Uh, I come from local government in where a council, a city council, is a policy-making body. They make the policies, but they hire two people, the city attorney and the city manager, the city manager to administrate the uh, governing, the, the uh, uh, city employees there, and to carry out the policies that the council sets. The city attorney is hired to make sure that he doesn't get in any trouble and that they're not doing something illegally, to protect the city council from illegalities. And that's a little more clear cut in that, but even there it, it overlaps. Policymakers sometimes have a tendency to get into administrative decision making. Administrators sometimes get into the position of making policy. And in that regard, in what we do to prevent the things uh, that happened at HUD is maybe delineating the duties, I agree with that. But from your experiences and perspective, tell me how is there a grave difficulty in going into, let's say, an agency like Department of Labor? Now, we talked a little bit about uh, moving career people into uh, appointed positions, making it available to them. I agree with that. Uh, I take my hat off to Secretary Dole, uh, Secretary of Labor. Uh, she is an outstanding person, as I have known and, and interacted with her. And she did exactly that. She took Bob Jones, who was a career person, and moved him into the assistant uh, uh, secretary labor position, which I think was credible to her because she understood of the experience and background of, that uh, Mr. Jones had for all the years that he worked there and all the programs that he's been involved in there, and that that was going to be a great attribute to him, to her. Not everybody's going to do that. Maybe that's the kind of mechanism we ought to be looking at of implementing to where that, that great possibility of that happening, a greater possibility of that happening than exists now. There may be other situations like this, but that's the one I know of. And I guess what I'm asking for comment back on all this that I've said is about those conflicts that exist in policy versus administration, policy versus law, and the potential for eliminating that with delineating the duties that the, and the responsibilities that these people have. Mr. Martinez, I just want to make one quick comment on the numbers. Uh, I, I would emphasize once more that that increasing the numbers of political appointees does not necessarily improve the ability to translate presidential policies into executive agency action. On the contrary, it can get in the way of it, as I earlier observed, through the very layering that then results and through the confusion of the lines of communication reaching uh, career people. Uh, but clearly there does, as you point out in the, in the municipal example, need to be uh, recognized the inevitability of some overlap between policy uh, development and, and uh, administrative follow through. Optimally, the career people contribute to the formulation of policy through drawing on uh, their experience and so on and expertise. Optimally, the, the political appointees want the benefit of, of that advice yeah. so that the policies actually chosen should in the end be policies that uh, everyone understands have been arrived at in a manner drawing on both a clear articulation of the policy priorities of the administration and the knowledge and experience that can then be yeah. brought to the process by career people. Our, our argument is that there is no conflict between the career civil servant and the political appointee by its basic nature. There should be no conflict. And uh, too often, as uh, Mr. Richardson pointed out in his opening remarks, uh, the feeling of suspicion and distrust 
is brought to the position by the new political appointee. And we have numerous examples of political appointees after a year or two on the job saying, my gosh, I never knew these people worked so hard and were so capable and so, you know, uh, uh, worthwhile in terms of carrying out what we want. But too often the initial uh, uh, impression is, well, we, uh, they may be the enemy and we have to worry about them. Uh, having had some background in government before, I went back into the Commerce Department, which was some 10 years later, in my case, uh, in 1969, the first person I called, I was then the general manager of the department, the first person I called into my office was the head of personnel administration. And I said, we are going to work together. And we are going to restructure, restaff, but it's going to be with your complete support and understanding. And we did, and I'd, I'm very happy about that because I think, uh, at least in the, brief, the two years plus that I was there, I think it was felt very clearly that the civil servant had a role, an important role, a consulting, implementing role to carry out the, the goals of the department, which we realized that the president has to be able to place uh, in responsible uh, posi uh, positions people that he has trust and ideological uh, compatibility. But you have to go I guess beyond in, that. In summing it up, uh, would you say that you know, uh, uh, Ambassador Richardson mentioned the Academy of Diplomacy, and where at least you attempt to give some instruction to, to people that are going to accept a new responsibility that they may not have had before. And I understand that it's it's very difficult for a person to step into a new position of responsibility, and not have a lot of apprehensions, and maybe have those fears that you say, uh, th these are the enemies, and I have to be careful. And it's not unnatural to understand that unless he breaks the ice to begin with, that the career person is going to have the attitude, I've been here all these years, I've had all these experience, I have all this knowledge. He knows nothing about the department. Here he's going to come and tell me what to do and how to do it. And right away to get over that isn't there maybe something that could be put in place, and I don't necessarily mean legislation, but I mean as a matter of, uh, of uh, wise uh, uh, decisions on the part of the administration to say, there's got to be some indoctrination to the people that we're appointing to these positions so they understand that. There should be no basic difference, in my mind, Mr. Martinez, between what a, a top executive does in the public service and what he does in the private sector. I have happened to have had the private sector experience many years of that. I have been chairman and chief executive of two companies that have both, both been on the New York Stock Exchange. I can assure you that an, a new chief executive coming into a company would be a fool if he said, all right, the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of all my top people that are reporting directly to me. Uh, he, he may do it, but it, he's not going to do it immediately, and he will only do it after he's had a, a proven time to make sure of his judgment. And the same thing applies in, in public service. Could but I what you're a talking about indoctrination, Mr. Martinez? This is a, a uh, an important recommendation of the task force uh, that I chaired and that uh, was adopted by the commission as a whole. And uh, while the Reagan administration was doing an increasingly good job toward the end uh, on this, and the Bush administration also uh, does a good job on this, uh, I think it's something that should be, in a sense, as we recommended, uh, more clearly institutionalized than it has so far been. Well, in summing up, I think what you're saying is that it really depends on the kinds of people you appoint to that top position. Yeah. And since that's the sole prerogative of the person making the appointment, that it depends on how well that person does their job. If they end up with people like Mr. Uh, Pierce and several others that we can mention, because uh, uh, it's not only HUD that we've had the problem with in that area. The you know, IRS is another area before Mr. Goldberg. I want to make that very clear. Uh, since Mr. Goldberg has been there, I think he's done an excellent job in trying to clean up some of the problems that they've had. And I think as equitable a job as Mr. Kemp is doing at HUD. But it really depends on that. And I guess in uh, my naivety, I still, I'm still looking for some way to nail it down so that we don't have to depend uh, on irresponsible appointments, uh, taking advantage of the American people because that's what happens. 
Thank you very much, Thank Congressman you. Martinez. Congressman Shays. Thank you. Um, Mr. Richardson, I, I heard your testimony. I'm sorry, Mr. Siciliano, I didn't. Um, but I just think it is very important uh, that we are having this hearing and in light of the 25 to 30 hearings we've had already because uh, when, it, when we get right down to it, uh, the very things you're talking about um, are, are the essence of, of what we need to, to, to go forward with in terms of our recommendations. And it seems to me that, that really what we did was we, we've had a, a study in the gross misconduct of the political people. We, we, haven't, uh, we haven't interviewed many of the career people uh, very candidly, but I will say that we've had, we found no heroes. It's, it's amazing that in the course of all the people who came before us, we didn't find one hero. We thought we found, once we thought we found someone and then we realized that person wasn't a hero and then we thought we found one other person who might be and then we realized there were other problems. They didn't want that project funded that the, that the secretary wanted funded because they wanted their project funded. So um, having said that, um, your point, Mr. Richardson, that, that the president needs his people is a very obvious one. Um, you kind of um, got my mind wondering a bit when you said the career professional must uh, have a place at the table because you may not be aware of it, but Du Bois Gilliam made, um, had an imagery. He said, if, if you're not at the table, you don't get to eat. But, he, uh, but the imagery was, very candidly, that it, it seems that the only people who were really at the table were the, career, were the political people and not the, not the career people. And it makes me think that, that, that um, when I went to graduate school in public administration, the theory was we had to have enough people so that the president could work his will. And I find it intriguing that you gentlemen are saying that you can have too many political people. Excuse me, you, have, you need to have political people so the president can work his will uh, or, or her will. And, and, and what you're saying. Just take a lot of your time either, Mr. Congressman Shays. The, I think the best thing I could do here would be to, to follow this up by, by sending you a marked copy of our task force report that addresses this point. Is it, is it possible that by your saying, if you had too many career people, uh, too many political people, they're the only ones who were at the table, so you didn't have the advantage of the, of the non-career people, I mean, at, excuse me, too many of the political people that the career people weren't at the table to be able to have that interaction? Well, I've, I've, I've tried to spell this out. Mr. I, I, I think what we're saying, at least what I'm trying to say is that it isn't a question of too many career people. It's a question I mean, of how you... Political people. I mean, political people. Yeah. It's how you use the political people. And if you use the political people, by you, I mean the secretary and his immediate undersecretary or deputy secretary, if they use the political people exclusively without the benefit of any of the feed-in that you get from career people who are there down the line, and if you don't see them, if you cut them out of the out of your council, or if you don't bring them to the table, as uh, Mr. Richardson indicates, you're going to get bad advice. That's true of management generally anywhere. And uh, we're simply saying that the careerist should have an opportunity to move up in the structure. And it used to be that the deputy assistant secretary universally was a careerist. That was yes. the pinnacle of the position that he could reach to. It's no longer true, and that's what we're trying to say. I, actually, the, the, the points are distinguishable. I agree with what Rocco Siciliano has said, but, go, but, the, but I, I do, would not uh, agree that, that there is no question of numbers. Well, yeah. The point, okay. briefly, Congressman Shays, is that where you have too many political appointees between yeah. the head of a department and the career people, uh, or where there are too many career, non-career people uh, bunched at some level between the, the head of the department and the career people, you can have several negative consequences. The first is that the the clarity of the leadership delivered to 
the career people is blurred. The to get to after all a a department head is a is trying to enlist the the knowledge, experience and dedication of a an ongoing institution on behalf of the programs and pri priorities of the president. Though these people were there before you came, they're going to be there after you left. You want to be able to, to, to harness, in the almost literal sense of that word, everything they can bring to the implementation of these policies and priorities. You've got to get across clearly to them why these priorities exist. What are the public interests at stake? No, I, I understand that part. I really do. And, I, and, and your testimony was clear on that. The, the, the part that I think that I'm just beginning to realize is that if you have too many people, uh, they're going to crowd out the others. And so no. in the secretary's no. office, you'll end up with, if you just These end up. These are distinctly different points, Congressman yeah, Chase. No, uh, too many, yeah. 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 But, but I understand your point. But the other point that I'm realizing is that if you have too many political people in the same office, there's no room for the career person to be there to, to interact. You can't get through. You can't and, get through. And I can see how too many people, and your point about limiting the number is a very obvious one, which is something right. I never, I El never thought Elliot of. Elliot talked about lines of communication, uh, the simplicity of, of effective communication between the bosses and the ones down the road. You've got, now you've got so many different layers. I, I have to be looking at an organization chart yes. of a major agency here. And it's, it's just too much. And they're all the layers in between our political appointees, newly created in the last 20 years in this no, one it's, agency. It's very clear to me, and I thank right. you for that testimony. Yeah. I'm not sure, Mr. Richardson, you have to uh, send me a copy of this statement. If you'd like to, that would be nice. But that was the only point I wanted to clarify. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much, Congressman Chase. Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Ambassador, I wonder if you could expand on the uh, response that you gave to the area that I touched on, on the opening. That is, uh, the, the, the study that you cite, the Stephen Stair University of California study, is just devastating about the percentage of, of respondents at the time this was going on in HUD, who, the, the career people who believed that the decisions were being made on a predominantly political level just devastating numbers. And yet, to the best of my knowledge, we did not have any of those people coming forward or stepping up to confront decisions that were being made in their agencies. Now, I agree with the chairman that the, the bulk of the people are really good, hardworking, capable, bright people. Uh, but they obviously did not feel that they had the room within which to make this kind of contribution. How do we, how, how can we encourage them? Uh, other people like them and in, 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 in other agencies or in this agency, new people, to, uh, to in fact feel that that's part of their obligation also, that they can't, they shouldn't just be sitting there and allowing wrong doing to go on without their, their responding to it. I think Congressman Weiss, uh, one important part of the answer uh, requires underscoring Congressman Shea's observation that in the course of these hearings, uh, you have not identified any heroes. Uh, I'd obviously, uh, a government should be not, not be run on the basis that people will be heroes any more than a military unit should be. If you have heroes, uh, that obviously uh, can be a, a significant added contribution to morale and effectiveness. Second, if you had the quality of leadership that uh, calls forth uh, the willingness to speak up and address problems and reflects a willingness to listen to those who have criticisms and act on those criticisms, then, of course, by definition, the problem 
you're dealing with is not likely to arise. The question, therefore, comes down to one of how do you encourage non-heroes <coughs> to speak up and come forward in circumstances in which their doing so is not encouraged but actually, in fact, discouraged, where they are not at the table, where they may feel that they they know things are going wrong, but they're not directly within their own immediate purview, or they don't have, perhaps, as concrete evidence as they might like, or, or indeed they may not want to have that evidence. They might rather uh, not be there. They might rather look the other way. I don't think that it's easy to, to uh, come up with uh, any pat formulas for dealing with that situation. I think uh, that there you see uh, a sort of degeneration of a uh, an organizational <laughs> structure that can only be addressed through the very broad kinds of recommendations that that uh, the National Commission of the Public Service, the Volcker Commission, has sought to develop. <laughs> We're dealing here with with a whole lot of things that have to do with appreciation of government service. Mm -hmm the qualifications of people, the, the sense of morale that is instilled in them overall, the, the general approach taken by an administration to the encouragement of uh, and welcoming of the contributions of career people and so on and so on. Yeah, well, I, 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 the only answer that occurs to me, obviously, where well, you've got a, a, an, an agency such as HUD, which from top to bottom as far as the political people was concerned, was, was uh, uh, captured and, and, and became one large cesspool. Uh, you couldn't expect the, the leadership to come from within the agency. But it seems to me that uh, what was happening during the Reagan years was that you also had at the top of the administration this attitude that career civil servants were not really very good people and that they were not worthwhile and in, indeed at the beginning that they were the enemy. Uh, and when you have that, it seems to me that the, the, the opposite, that if you got leadership at the presidential level, that maybe you could then embolden people to stand up for what they think is right. But without that, uh, when you've got problems within the agency and there is no, no place else that you can, you can complain to or think that you're gonna get support from, you're dead. That's exactly right. Without being political too much, uh, bureaucrat bashing became very fashionable in, in 76, and it continued in 80. And in, in a sense, we say this in our report, which is one of the reasons that you've seen a decline in, in, of interest in young people as far as public service is concerned. And of course, obviously, we're hoping to get that uh, changed. And, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thank you. Could, could Thank I, you. as a careerist, respond Ambassador as well to that question? Because I think it's a terribly important question. It is. As Elliot has said, it is not something that you instill overnight. It isn't something you put in place like that. Let me just offer three things that I think are essential to creating an atmosphere in which people are prepared to uh, speak out. The first, Elliot has emphasized, and which is so terribly important, that is leadership. Leadership over a period of time that hopefully has encouraged rather, not, rather than discouraged people within their ranks prepared to speak, uh, whether they're political but particularly if they're a career. That's essential. Secondly, a, a policy, a practice of recognition within an agency, so important in motivating in uh, the ranks of employees to do their jobs and do, their, do them well. Mo rec recognizing those people who do stick their necks out and having some kind of program in place in that agency to give credibility to that. Uh, the Department of State, which isn't always the best in terms of its rank sticking its necks out, I know <laughs> that to be the case. Uh, we do have, however, something, a series of prestigious awards um, that recognize create what we call creative dissent. And we give that as much recognition, publicity, notice every year as we can 
to try to encourage that uh, practice within a department among the ranks to show some creativity and a, a, and a readiness to take a risk in dissenting and on the part of the leadership recognizing that when it happens by some kind of process of awards. And then if I might add a third, and that is an acronym, uh, CCW, uh, Challenge Conventional Wisdom, always. If we can see that developed across the board in any agency, for that matter, I think in any institution, uh, a willingness on the part of the ranks and the leadership always to challenge conventional wisdom. That's so important in any organization, not least in the field of diplomacy. And I think I can say that with some credibility, having coming out of the, come out of the Iran experience, where that acronym over many administrations did not adequately apply. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Congressman Weiss. And I know I speak for all of my colleagues on this subcommittee in thanking all three of our distinguished witnesses for extremely significant and, and illuminating testimony. We all look forward to, to the conclusion of the work of your most important uh, uh, commission and uh, hope that your recommendations will be translated into public policy. I want to uh, thank again all three of you. Thank uh, you very much, Mr. Chairman. Our, uh, thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you very much, Ambassador Langen. Our next witness is Mr. Leonard Briscoe. Uh, and uh, before calling him, I would like to make the following statement. I received a request from Mr. Briscoe through his attorney invoking his right under House Rule 11.3.F.2 as a subpoenaed witness not to be photographed at today's hearing and also invoking his right not to present testimony during television and or radio broadcasting of this hearing. The subcommittee will observe this House rule. However, this remains an open hearing. Journalists are free to take notes and to remain here during Mr. Briscoe's testimony. The rule that is being invoked is a rule with which the chair strongly disagrees, but will, of course, enforce. <clears throat> the rule reads as follows. No witness served with a subpoena by the committee shall be required against his or her will to be photographed at any hearing or to give evidence or testimony while the broadcasting of that hearing by radio or television is being conducted. At the request of any such witness who does not wish to be subjected to radio, television, or still photography coverage, all lenses shall be covered and all microphones used for coverage turned off. <clears throat> this subparagraph is supplementary to Clause 2K5 of this rule relating to the protection of the rights of witnesses. It is the Chair's judgment which uh, is the basis for his disagreeing with this rule that uh, the intimacy and immediacy of radio and television coverage in fact protects witnesses, uh, but uh, until this rule is changed by the House, uh, the chair, of course, will enforce it. Uh, therefore, I ask uh, uh, radio and television and still photography to cease at this moment, and uh, the chair calls to the table Mr. Leonard Briscoe. At this point in the hearing, Mr. Briscoe exercised his Fifth Amendment rights, asking that camera coverage be suspended. We'll resume our coverage of the hearing as the next witness is called before the panel. Cameras, uh, radio may be turned on, still photography may resume. Uh, before we hear from uh, our witness, uh, the chair would merely like to summarize briefly what uh, transpired uh, in the period of our uh, previous witnesses' appearance. Uh, Mr. Briscoe has been given by the committee uh, ample time to prepare his testimony. He has received a continuance from the committee, yet uh, he uh, uh, chose to invoke his uh, Fifth Amendment privilege uh, against self-incrimination. Uh, the chair propounded a number of questions 
and uh, in each instance uh, the Fifth Amendment was invoked and the chair and uh, his colleagues asked if all questions will be answered uh, by invoking the Fifth Amendment. Mr. Briscoe's response was in the affirmative. Under those circumstances, uh, we felt prolonging uh, his questioning was unnecessary uh, and not productive, and he was uh, excused. This first? Let's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. Mr. Auslander, the subcommittee invited you to testify because you have significant and relevant information concerning another witness, Mr. Briscoe, and also because you have significant and relevant information concerning the workings of the moderate rehabilitation program. You agreed to testify on a voluntary basis. However, in a preposterous and contemptible fashion, you have tried to use your appearance here to advance your own interests in a legal dispute you have with other entities. This is an unacceptable abuse of your obligation to appear before a congressional committee. In reading your prepared testimony, I recognize that you have an ongoing contractual dispute with a company called CDC Financial. However, this is not the people's court and I'm not Judge Wapner. Thus, I'm requesting that you limit all of your comments to your involvement with the Section 8 Mod Rehab Program. Representations that individuals may have made to you concerning their ability to secure Mod Rehab units and your experiences as a competitor of Mr. Briscoe in Florida. Furthermore, let me publicly warn you and reprimand you about attempting to use this committee or your testimony here today for the purposes of blackmail, extortion, or leverage in any private contractual dispute you may have. I shall now enter into the record three letters that you recently sent. This is the transcription of a faxed memo dated 529-90 from you to Mr. Arthur Greenblatt of CDC Financial. Greetings. It appears from the attachments that I'm capable of making some headlines and attracting some attention. I have volunteered to testify before the Lantos Committee on June 21, ostensibly to discuss the Black Manafort affair. However, it's not Black Manafort that I'm after, it's you. In exchange for giving the committee what they want, I've been promised the Justice Department criminal investigation into your personal and business affairs, as well as Stephen Erie, Bob Downing, and CNA Insurance. I am prepared to fully discuss your alleged criminal activities regarding our business relationships and resulting disputes at the June 21 hearing, which will be televised live on C-SPAN. I've suggested to Paul Manafort that he or one of his legal associates mediate our business disputes between now and June 21 before my scheduled, quote, testimony, end quote. Since we are under a court order to mediate Cyprus, in any case, this action at this time would be reasonable and appropriate. I have no motive in testifying before Congress other than to splash your name 
and the names of Downing, Erie, Wetzel, Gammon, and Cunningham in front of the Lantus Committee. Exclamation point, please advise. The chair will now read a second transcription of your faxed memo dated 6490. Jeff Auslander to Richard Goss of Chapman and Cutler. Greetings. As you can tell from the attachments, I've been able to attract some attention lately regarding my knowledge of activities involving Black Manafort, etc. As I communicated to Paul Manafort Esquire and CDC Financial last week, I'm not particularly anxious to focus further attention upon Manafort when it is CDC Financial Arthur Greenblatt, Stephen Eric, and Robert Downing, toward whom I am most interested in focusing attention. It is my intent to expose at the hearing scheduled for June 21 the, quote, fraudulent and illegal activities, quote, of CDC Financial, its officers and stockholders, one of whom, Bob Downing, is an agent of your client, CNA Insurance. I plan to link Downing to Jim Gammon, Bob Wetzel and Phil Cunningham, as far as my two HODAC projects are concerned. By way of background, I have not been subpoenaed for this testimony, but rather I have been invited based upon my knowledge of the MOD Rehab HUD program. However, in exchange for this testimony, I have reached an understanding with the Lantus Committee to recommend the criminal investigation to the Justice Department of CDC and its activities. I am prepared to expose a great deal of alleged misconduct with respect to my projects. I have suggested to Paul Manafort that he consider mediating my disputes with CDC Financial before June 21, my scheduled day of testimony. Otherwise, I am prepared to make my case publicly on C-SPAN and in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Perhaps in the past you and your client have tended to believe the assertions of Arthur Greenblatt and Bob Downing that, quote, the problems with Auslander, quote, were under control. This certainly is not the case. I am deadly serious about my intentions to, quote, go public with my allegations of fraud, civil theft, racketeering, payoffs, and kickbacks. I would hope that you and your client would consider, quote, coaxing, end quote, CDC Financial to the mediation table before June 21. I shall now read transcription of a handwritten memo dated 5-2490, Jeff Auslander to Paul Manafort Esquire. This was prepared by our subcommittee. Comments. I seem to have attracted a good deal of attention, but not intentionally toward your firm or you personally. I'm very anxious to direct my efforts towards the disputes with CDC Financial and Arthur Greenblatt. Obviously, the Lantus Committee would like me to testify about your firm, which I'm not anxious to do. However, their aide has said they would consider recommending criminal prosecution by the Justice Department against CDC if I cooperate. I would like you or an associate to mediate my disputes for a fee with CDC before June 21. Please advise. Now, I am so outraged and appalled by this attempted abuse of your obligation to appear before this subcommittee that I wish to again read and then continue and conclude my reading of an opening statement. Mr. Auslander, in reading your prepared testimony, I recognize that you have an ongoing contractual dispute with a company called CDC Financial. However, this is not the people's court and I'm not Judge Wapner. Thus, I am requesting that you limit your comments to your involvement with the Section 8 Mod Rehab Program, representations that individuals may have made to you concerning their ability to secure Mod Rehab units, 
and your experience as a competitor of Mr. Briscoe in Florida. Furthermore, let me publicly <coughs> warn you and reprimand you about attempting to use this committee or your testimony here today for the purpose of blackmail, extortion, or leverage in any private contractual dispute. I have entered the record of three letters that you recently sent. Mr. Auslander, your statement, quote, that in exchange for this testimony, I've reached an understanding with this subcommittee to recommend the criminal investigation to the Justice Department of CDC and its activities, end quote, is totally false, without any basis, and utterly contemptible. I want to read this again. Your statement that in exchange for your testimony, you have reached an understanding with this subcommittee, recommend a criminal investigation to the Justice Department of CDC and its activities, is totally false, without any basis, and utterly contemptible. Now that I have set the record straight, you may proceed and remember that you are under oath and that perjury is punishable by up to five years in prison. Congressman Shays. I know that, that um, I knew last night that Mr. Auslander had, I had been told last night by the subcommittee that he had uh, allegedly done this. I had not seen the documents and I'm just, uh, would like to uh, just put on the record whether or not he in fact did write these documents. Is that all right with you? Please. Uh, these three documents that were read to you, did you do these things? Uh, yes, Congressman, I did. Okay. Did you have any understanding with the committee that this would happen? I spoke with the committee staff over a matter of weeks. I discussed my particular interests in testifying before you today. My uh, testimony, the four pages, were submitted yesterday per their request before noon. These matters were discussed at length by me, and I said very clearly that I had interest in pursuing the disputes and the uh, repercussions of those disputes at this testimony, and I discussed the particular nature of them. Did you have any quid pro quo with, uh, agreement with any me uh, member no. of the staff that uh, if you testified that this committee would initiate an investigation? Number one, I brought it up. It was my uh, matter of discussion with uh, Celia Boddington, and I understood that there was an ongoing investigation. That's not the question I asked. The question I asked was, uh, the inference from your letter is that in, in return for uh, your inference, uh, the statement in, in one of these memos was that if you testified, the committee would then initiate an investigation. Was that in fact true or did you lie in your memo? No, I I'd, ra didn't. I'd rather, you, uh, I just want to remind you that you're under oath and it's important that you be very clear on this. I did not intentionally lie. I believed truthfully that there was an If my colleague will yield. Yes, sir. The question is not whether you intentionally lied or not. This is the last time I'm warning you that you are under oath and the penalty for perjury is five years in prison. Did this subcommittee tell you that a criminal investigation of your commercial competitor will be undertaken if you testify? No. So you lied, is that correct? I didn't believe I lied, but I, didn't, I did not know that that was the case. That is not satisfactory. We will read your statements again, and we will read them until the cows come home, and I will read them slowly, because you lied. You are now not going to go on to your testimony until you admit that you lied. We both know that you lied. May I have the statements? It is in your interest to get this over with because you have valuable testimony to offer. But this issue will not be obfuscated before we begin your questioning. I am reading from your June 6 faxed memo. You admitted 
to a question by Congressman Shays that this is your memo. Is that correct? That's correct. I shall now read from this memo. By way of background, June 4th. I have not been subpoenaed for this testimony, but rather I have been invited based upon my knowledge of the MUD Rehab HUD program. Please listen to me closely now. However, however, in exchange for this testimony, I have reached an understanding with the Lantos Committee to recommend a criminal investigation to the Justice Department of CDC and its activities. Did you reach such an understanding? No, I didn't. So your statement is a lie? Well, I am not, I don't have it in front of me. You are directed to answer the question. I did not intend to lie to anybody. You will be given you, a copy of your facts, and the question will be put to you again, and you will give a yes or no answer, because you either had such an understanding or you didn't. For, for the record, this is your June 4th um, memo. I am dealing with paragraph 3. I shall again read the statement. Congressman Martinez. Well, uh, he's looking for that, uh, which, that particular paragraph or sentence <clears throat> on the uh, subsequent memo, which was dated, or another memo which was dated May the 25th. Right. Uh, he, it, it is even more than just an understanding. It says, I have been promised a Justice Department criminal investigation into your personal and business affairs, as well as Stephen Iyer, Bob Downing, and CNA. You are absolutely correct, Congressman Martinez. And after, after the witness will respond uh, in a straightforward manner to the first item, that will be the second question he will respond to. Then we will go on to questioning you on other matters. Well. So I, I will now read the statement again. I'm asking you to listen carefully, and I'm directing you to answer the question. I'm now reading from your memorandum dated June 4, 1990. In exchange for this testimony, I have reached an understanding with the Lantos Committee to recommend a criminal investigation to the Justice Department of CDC and its activities. Is that statement true? Um, I'm reading it here. I see it on June 4th. No, that's not true. Is that statement, therefore, a false statement? That statement's a false statement. Is that statement a lie? Well, in terms of how you put it, yes. I'm not asking you how I put it. I'm asking you to put it. Is I that believe, a lie? I believed I had that understanding. Apparently, I was mistaken. It was a lie. It's a lie. Now I'm going to the May 25 memo. I am reading the first paragraph of your memo. Is this your memo, sir? Is May 25th? Yes. Yes. You wrote this. Yes. I'll read it. Greetings. It appears from the attachments that I'm capable of making some headlines and attracting some attention. I have volunteered to testify before the Lantos Committee on June 21, ostensibly to discuss the Black Manafort affair. However, it's not Black Manafort that I'm after, it's you, capitalized. Now I'm reading the critical phrase. Please listen carefully. In exchange for giving the committee what they want, I have been promised the Justice Department criminal investigation into your personal and business affairs, as well as Stephen Erie, Bob Downing, and CNA Insurance. Is this statement true? Uh, no, it's not. Is this a false statement? Yes. Did you write that false statement? On this uh, particular fax memo, yes. You is therefore this statement contained in the memo you wrote a lie? Yes, it would appear so. Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I am somewhat at a loss at words because uh, uh, 
you are also stating that you are well aware of alleged criminal activities. Um, and really, I'm just. My, my question to you, Mr. Chairman, is we have an individual who, one, tried to uh, blackmail someone. It's very clear that he tried to, using our committee. Um, so it does call into question some of his statements and the believability of his statements. But then he also says in this memo that he is aware of alleged criminal activities on the part of uh, this firm, CDC Financial. And it does seem to me that um, we as a committee need to be aware if in fact there are criminal activities. I don't know if this is the place for it, but it seems to me that uh, this gentleman either has to be uh, asked now or asked later if, there, if he is aware of any criminal activities. In other words, that may be a false, a, a false statement too, and if it is a false statement, it shouldn't be allowed to stay on the record. We know now, uh, we know from this memo that you, you said there was a quid pro quo on the part of this committee. Uh, and understanding, and we've established under oath that that's simply a lie, and that's important for everyone to know. It is a lie. There was no quid pro quo for your coming before this committee at all. Um, but uh, now there's another part of it, and the other part is that you're alleging that there was criminal activity. And I would uh, respectfully ask Mr. Chairman when it is appropriate to ask this gentleman uh, whether or not he is aware of criminal activity. Is this the time or? Uh, I, I think we will have a number of questions to propound and then it okay. will be perfectly okay. appropriate to raise those Thank questions. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir Auslander, you were a competitor of Mr. Briscoe's in West Palm Beach. And in the summer of 1987, you were up against him to develop a $3 million, 206-unit housing and development action grant project. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. What was the name of that project? Well, the project that I proposed to the city of West Palm Beach at that time was a project called Cypress Run Apartments. I understand that there was a meeting of the local town council to decide who should develop the project, you or Leonard Briscoe. Can you describe what happened at that meeting? There was a public meeting held by the city council, the city of West Palm Beach, to determine which of two finalists out of initially, I believe, seven applicants would be selected to undertake the development of a $3 million HODAG grant that had been recycled by the city of West Palm Beach. The original award winner had turned back the grant because the property had been sold. So the city undertook a public advertising uh, effort to uh, uh, solicit bids. Uh, Mr. Briscoe and myself and a partner of mine were selected as finalists and we were asked to compete in a public forum uh, in front of the city council of the city of West Palm Beach. And that we did. Now, I understand Lance Wilson, who was then working for Payne Weber, flew down to Florida to speak on Mr. Briscoe's behalf before the town council. Can you tell us about that? My partner and I appeared to represent our interest and to propose our project at that time. Mr. Briscoe appeared with a, uh, an attorney, a Mr. Ken Spilius, a former county commissioner. Uh, Mr. Lance Wilson appeared on his behalf at that time. And we both had an opportunity to make our presentations. Um, essentially, Lance Wilson uh, was there as a, an officer, I believe, of Payne Weber. And he indicated that Mr. Briscoe's proposal was superior to ours because ours had been based upon the use of low-income housing tax credits. And Mr. Wilson made the comment at that time that the credits were not um, practical nor realistic. They were a pie-in-the-sky uh, uh, method of um, funding these projects. And Mr. Briscoe's proposal was not based on that premise. Was that a truthful statement? Well, at that time, Payne Weber was soliciting nationwide investors for their large tax credit packages, and 
Payne Weber was a player in that market, so one could reach his own conclusions. What was your conclusion? Well, my conclusion was I had worked with tax credits and they had worked for me and our proposal was based on a very sound, financially competent, feasible proposal and we were prepared to go forward with it and the city of West Palm Beach apparently agreed because we were awarded that grant and the project's currently about 50% complete. So your statement is that Lance Wilson's testimony to the city council was false? Misleading. Misleading. At worst. Why were you and not Mr. Briscoe awarded that grant, the Hodak project? Based upon comments made by city commissioners Mr. And, and representations made by Mr. Briscoe in the public meeting, uh, Mr. Briscoe's project depended on a contribution of community development block grant funds by the city of West Palm Beach to his project. Initially, I believe in the amount of a million two. Thereafter, it was amended to the level of $600,000. Um, we made no such request. As a result, um, the city indicated it didn't have the availability of the funds and they really could not, from what I could determine, approve Mr. Briscoe's a, a proposal which they felt uh, sympathetic about and they indicated that but they didn't have the money. So, so they seemed to go toward our proposal as a result. Uh, Mr. Briscoe nevertheless went on to develop the Wedgwood Plaza UDAG project in Riviera Beach. You wrote to HUD objecting to this uh, UDAG project. Can you tell us why? Well, yes I can, Mr. Chairman. Correspondence that, that I wrote, and just allow me to grab the copies, um, in 1986, May 7th, a letter from me to uh, Secretary Pierce indicated that I'd been awarded, and this again is prior to the Cyprus project uh, that you referenced, this is much earlier. I'd been awarded in 1984 a, a HODAG housing development grant for $2,650,000 in Riviera Beach, Florida. And uh, my project uh, had been there uh, well before any discussion of a UDAG had taken place. It was no more than a thousand yards away from the proposed UDAG of 520 units and I was concerned and, and expressed my concern to Secretary Pierce as to the adverse impact on our marketability and feasibility. And I think it was somewhat prophetic because my last sentence said, I look forward to a response at your earliest convenience. My attorneys have advised me to take legal action to prevent the likelihood of a default occurring or worse to our project or the other project. Um, Currently, there is a default on Mr. Briscoe's I'm sorry. project. Currently, there is a default on Mr. Briscoe's project. I believe it's in foreclosure. So, the Boyce Gilliam wrote back to me on May 23rd about the questions I raised regarding the Wedgwood Plaza project. These are matters that, and he writes, these are matters which the city of Riviera Beach is equipped to answer, and our policies require applicants and recipients respond to such questions. Accordingly, we have written to Mr. Wilkins, city manager, requesting the city answer your letter with copy sent to this office and to the Jacksonville field office. I noted a conversation I had with the city manager, Mr. Wilkins, that I spoke with him as a result of this letter from Mr. Gilliam, and his comment was the rent-ups will not interfere. That, that is, they didn't believe the timing would be such that rent-ups would, would interfere with each other. Um, you know, as it turns out, uh, their project's complete and it's in foreclosure and all kinds of problems have resulted. For the record, the chair would like to clarify that this is the same project, I believe it's called Wedgwood Plaza, which has been foreclosed on and that Royal Palm Savings and Loan, which put up some of the financing for Wedgwood Plaza, is also defaulted. Is that true? To the best of my knowledge, that's true. Was it your view during this period that Mr. Briscoe had an inside track at HUD to which you didn't have access? I don't believe anybody had access like he did. Um, it was quite obvious to Palm Beach County officials 
since he developed two UDAGs within the county, that he had a, an open access route to UDAGs. And uh, basically what he did was to suggest and ultimately convince the city of Belle Glade, city of Riviera Beach, to declare themselves, quote unquote, as a pocket of poverty, which moved their applications on an instantaneous basis to the top of the list. And taking that route was the way to get the priority he needed to then go to the apparently the right people and to obtain the uh, the authorizations. It is my understanding that Mr. Briscoe developed close ties between his company and city officials in Riviera Beach by hiring a number of them. Would you comment on this and expand on this? Well, it wasn't just Riviera Beach where I lived and where I was a director of the largest employer, a New York Stock Exchange company. I could start at the north end of the county or the south end. He employed a number of public officials through the course of his business activities in the county. In Riviera Beach, he employed one of the city councilmen, Dexter Orange, as a development official of his company. He employed, as I said earlier, Ken Spilius, a former county commissioner, who was an attorney and his primary mouthpiece for his activities before the county board. He employed Alan Schneer, former housing and community development official, the top official of Palm Beach County. He employed James Poole, attorney and city councilman in the city of West Palm Beach. He employed the mayor of West Palm Beach, Rick Rakenis, as a civil engineer who did the engineering on the Wedgwood project in Riviera Beach. Um, and I think he also, although I wouldn't consider this a public official, but he likewise hired away from Royal Palm Savings, their chief financial officer, after their loan apparently was made, and uh, installed him as his chief financial officer at the Briscoe Companies in West Palm. So there's instances of seven or eight cases where those people were hired away from public and semi-public bodies, institutions, to work with them. Are you suggesting that the savings and loan official was hired away after he approved the loan and that arrangement uh, was already in the works when the loan was granted? Well, I don't know that as a fact, but the timing was there. And uh, I didn't do business with them in any case. I have no firm knowledge one way or the other. But, but the timing seems to be coincidental. Now, let me ask a que few questions concerning uh, the black Manafort relationship. I understand that you first worked with Russell Cartwright, who later went to work for Black Manafort, Stone and Kelly, when he was on the staff of Senator Paula Hawkins, and that you worked with him on your Hodag grant in Riviera Beach in the fall of 90. Is that correct? Well, not totally. I didn't really work with him. I did that project and developed it independent of Senator Hawkins' staff. Um, I only went to see Senator Hawkins subsequent to submitting it to HUD because my consulting firm in Washington had suggested that at a um, dinner I came to, a Steve Bollinger uh, testimonial, it was after he died and was to raise some funds, that it would be uh, helpful just to stop in and meet with the Senator. At that time, I had met with Russell Cartwright for the first time. I'd never known him before. This would have been September of 84. After this, Mr. Russell Cartwright joined Black Manafort firm. Is that correct? Well, yeah, subsequent information tells me yes. I didn't know it at the time. How did you find out about this? I received a call from him probably late summer of 86, indicating that he had left the senator's staff and had moved on to Black Manafort. Now, you told subcommittee investigators that just before the elections in August or September of 86, you received a phone call from Mr. Russell Cartwright asking if you would be interested in receiving mud rehab units. Is this accurate? He called me to uh, suggest just that, that, that uh, 
he could deliver some units to Palm Beach County. It would not have been directly to me because there's an intermediary step through the housing authorities. So that uh, we were talking about locating units in Palm Beach County. Yes, that's correct. The call that you received from Mr. Cartwright, was it unsolicited? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. In this phone conversation with Mr. Cartwright, what reason did he give you for wanting to do business outside of Dade County? He indicated at that time or at a subsequent uh, instance where we either talked or got together that there had been too much of a concentration of Section 8 mod rehab units in Dade County and greater Miami area. And they felt there was a need to uh, move some of the units northward uh, to the other areas of the state. And uh, he thought that there may be a need for some of the units in Palm Beach County. Had you worked with the MUD rehab program prior to this? No, I had not. How many units did you obtain through the efforts of Black Manafort? And what did you pay for the units? There was a uh, understanding reach that they could deliver 118 units of Section 8 mod rehab to two housing authorities in Palm Beach County, and that the fee for their services to me would be $1,000 per unit. Was this described to you as the going rate? I'm not sure he, at that time, that is Russell Cartwright told me it was a going rate, but Subsequently, it seemed that that was a rate charged by consultants who were able to obtain those types of units. Now, you had more recent dealings with Black Manafort. In 1987, you invited Russell Cartwright to work with you on upgrading a building in Savannah, Georgia. What was the name of this project? Um, it was about that time uh, I had uh, some contact with a project in Savannah, Georgia that uh, looked as if it would lend itself as a physical property, 150 units, 75 uh, duplexes, as a uh, likely candidate for a mod rehab activity. And um, I had suggested that he take a look at it, and he agreed and came up to Savannah. I believe he flew in and then we drove up. Did you bring him and the firm into the project in the belief that they had influence in obtaining mod rehab units? I had suggested to him that uh, this was a good candidate project for consideration. We had one meeting. I introduced him to the players, that is the owners uh, of the property, and never heard back from him. Um, subsequently, I learned that they went forward with the Cruz, Fox, Manafort people, and they proceeded to try and put the thing together. Now, Ms. Manafort is the M in the CFM project, which developed the Seabrook, New Jersey project. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Was Chairman. anyone else from CFM involved in the Savannah project? Well, not while I was there at that time. I know from subsequent uh, observation of documents at the lender that uh, Mr. Fox, no, it was Mr. Cruz visited Savannah several times and actually made a proposal to the lender to obtain financing for their proposed mod rehab project. Um, it appears that it was a very likely candidate for mod rehab section 8. I don't know the status of any of this because I wasn't involved as a subsequent matter. But I have since purchased those units from the lender and I'm trying to do a conventional project with it. Congressman Shays. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to pass it this time uh, until we get to the other matter. Oh, I see. Okay, good. Um, I'd, I'd like to, to uh, if, with your permission, uh, Mr. Chairman, just uh, ask a few more questions about the memos. Of course. Um, do you have all, all the copies of the memos in front of you? Yes, I do, Congressman. Okay. There's a memo written, 524, a handwritten memo to Paul Manafort, which was read. And then 525, a, me a memo to Arthur Greenblatt. 
Um, now, Paul Manafort was, is a, a partner in Black, Manafort, and Stone. Arthur Greenblatt is, who is Arthur Greenblatt? He's the principal and official of CDC Financial. Okay. And then um, uh, there's a 6-4 memo to, uh, is it Richard Goaz? How do I spell it's it? Richard Goss, attorney. G-O-W-S, okay. Looks like it's an A. It's here. a G-O-S-S -S okay. spelling. Now, um, I'm interested to know, did you um, write uh, memos to, um, to uh, anyone else that we don't have a record of in regards to your appearance before this committee? No, Congressman, I didn't. Okay. okay. Uh, secondly, I would like to know, uh, you say it is my intent to expose that the hearing scheduled for June, I'm referring to the June 4th memo. Uh, hearing scheduled for June 21st, the, f quote, fraudulent and illegal activities, end of quote, of CDC Financial, its officers and stockholders. And then you name some, you say, one of whom was Bob Downing, one of whom, Bob Downing, is an agent of your client, CNA Insurance. Um, are you, in fact, aware of any uh, fraudulent or illegal activities on the part of CDC Financial? Yes, I believe I am. Okay. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, are you aware of any fraudulent or illegal activities on the part of Black Manafort or, and Stone? Um, not no, I don't believe so. Well, no, I want to be precise about this because they, they have a right to have their name cleared if they're not guilty of any illegalities. I'm I never accused them of any Ill illegalities. No, 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 what you said, and I think it's very important to uh, say this, I am not particularly anxious to focus further attention up upon Manafort when it is CDC Financial, Arthur Greenblatt, Stephen Urey, and Robert Downing toward whom I am most interested in focusing attention. That implies that uh, th there's an implication that you may be aware of some illegal activities on their part, let me finish, but choose to focus attention on the person who you in your memo of, uh, I guess the 25th, in which you write to Arthur Greenblatt and say, um, the man of, however, it's not Black Manafort that I am after, it's you. Whether or not you're after Black Manafort and Stone, the question is, are you aware of any illegalities on, on the part of that company or any of its partners? No, I'm not, and I, oh. don't in, I never intended to suggest that I was. Well, I only uh, understood that this committee was interested and had asked me about my connections with them, and uh, it had been in the newspapers, and uh, it was just uh, a reference that you know, I wasn't trying to make uh, a big issue out of it. Well, let me just say for the record, the only reason I'm asking is that I want to make sure that this firm is not being accused in any way of any illegalities or fraudulent activities. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, if a gentleman is aware of illegal and fraudulent activities, I don't know when the time it, it is to have it come forward, but it seems to me sometime it needs to. So what activities are you aware of uh, where there is fraud or illegalities on the part of this firm? Well, Congressman, I have developed $30 million worth of hodags, two projects that have been referenced, Riviera Beach Gardens, Cypress Run Apartments in West Palm Beach. I spent six years of my life, all the money that I ever was able to accumulate and earn, putting these together. I didn't use any shortcuts. I went by the books. I spent the time necessary in planning, developing the best projects that I knew how to do. And I went to CNA Insurance because I lost my bank financing after the Tax Reform Act of 86 went in. I went to CNA Insurance through a bond underwriter. What does that stand for, CNA? I have the Continental Insurance Companies. Okay. To obtain tax-exempt mortgage financing. I was successful in interesting them in two HODAG projects in Palm Beach County. I entered into commitments for that financing. They were arm's length, they were legitimate, and they closed. Unfortunately, CNA employed the services of a special advisor, a fellow by the name of Robert Downing, who, as it turned out, was a partner, a, a stockholder of CDC Financial, and who coerced us into using CDC Financial as a syndicator on the basis that if we didn't use this firm 
and we didn't uh, conclude business agreements with them, the bond financing would not be there, would not materialize, and wouldn't be available. Since these transactions have taken place, I had invested up until that time a million one of investment capital. I had um, contracted for fees in the range of two million seven to be paid to me and my partners, and uh, I've never really received a dime of funds. The projects have been victimized, I've been victimized, and I believe a criminal racketeering activity has taken place. I said so in my prepared statement, which I had submitted. I talked to the staff about it. This isn't something I sprung on you. I acknowledge some misconduct in the way I referenced this, but I've been in a very difficult situation for the last year, and this has been a very trying time for me. I'm very proud of what I've accomplished over 20 years of development activities in low-income housing. I'm not proud of what I said. I was desperate. I have been totally ruined. My partner is in bankruptcy because these people have victimized us. They victimized the HUD system. They've subverted the HUD system of delivering low-income housing. The CDC people in Seabrook showed their true colors. They went on to bigger and more profitable activities. And I sit here before you as a ruined man virtually from their predatory activities. And I make no bones about it. And I don't make, uh, not hiding anything. I'm here without an attorney. I'm just laying my case on the table. And I'll answer any questions as I have been that you care to ask me about. And I have backup documentation, witnesses, hard evidence that this has taken place. Okay, um, let me just say to you that um, I haven't researched any of the information that you're talking about, so uh, I want to just first be clear, is the extent of the fraud and illeg illegal activities the fact that uh, Robert Downing was a partner of CDC Financial and you did not know it? We never knew it. He was a stockholder. No, that's the question is, though, is that the extent, in your judgment, of the, of the uh, fraud and illegal activities? Is no. There, is there anything no, there, else there, that you want to What would you else would you add? Well, we entered into business agreements that called upon CDC to perform functions as a syndicator for our projects. In addition to which, there was a third project that we've referenced as the Mod Rehab Section 8 for Palm Beach County. Um, I relied on those agreements, even though we were coerced into them. And uh, I thought there was a chance that, that matters would work out, that the funds could ultimately be there and we could do business. And could you explain the word coerce? Well, as I indicated, um, I did not know the CDC people. I never met them. They were brought to the table. No, but coerce means that you kind of were forced to do something. Coerce is, I guess, the, the, the very way I would describe your memos to, uh, to Greenblatt and Manafort and so on. You, how were you coerced? I saw how you through, wanted to coerce others. But. Well, through Downing and statements made by him, both to myself and to our bond underwriters, um, the message was given to us quite clearly that if we did not bring in CDC as syndicator and partner, managing partner, general partner of our projects, the financing would not be there for us. Okay. And that yeah. represented $13.5 million worth of tax-exempt bonds on $30 million worth of development. Now, um, what were your alternatives? At that time, there were no other, that I was aware of, no other insurance companies or bond purchasers that were in the market for this type of an instrument. So I guess the point I need to know I is if you, did, if you didn't link up with CDC, who would you have linked up with? Well, there are a number of syndicators doing business in the United States who are in the business of uh, packaging tax credit deals and retailing them to broker dealers who you're, bring You're in assuming dollars. I know something that I don't know. I'm sorry. And no, that's not your fault. Uh, you're assuming I need to know what, did you lock yourself into something that had you known of before, if you hadn't locked yourself into, you wouldn't have been in a position to be coerced. It seems to me that the tax law of 86 was your downer. That's, that's, that's really what put you and a whole host of other developers uh, in a very bad situation. Not really. There was a cost of waiting to do business. We had a, a carrying cost, but the tax credit 
program is an excellent program that can produce the necessary results to, to developers it, it, to, who need to produce the housing. It's a okay, be patient with me a second here. If you, uh, if you had not linked up with Robert Downing, who you were alleging was a partner of CDC, what would you have done? You were having trouble getting financing, correct? No, no. I had the financing okay. locked up with CNA. They had signed bond purchase agreements yeah. for $13.5 million. Okay, so, dollars. so far things are going pretty well. You have, you have the financing agreements. Right. Once we have the financing, we can uh, structure the project finances, the tax credits, the cost basis, and we put together the feasibilities and the cash flows. Okay, from, okay I'm at that point. Now where do we go from here? All right. At that point, when you've got a project pro forma, as it is, together we can go to a syndicator, generally speaking, who will look at that and say it's worth X number of dollars to us to buy your equity with the tax credits and resell it to investors. So typically we'd go out and shop around to see what we could come up with from firms who we would typically do business with. Mm -hmm. So then what happened? Well, in my case, I had some misgivings about the CDC proposals and the arrangements. But this is now Robert Downing is working for you? No, no, he didn't work for me. He worked and, for and CNA. And no, he's working as a consultant for you. you, you no, no, he never worked for me. He worked for CNA Insurance. He negotiated and structured the I'm bond I'm sorry, issues. okay. He worked for CNA but had a relationship with CDC. Correct. Okay. And um, at that time... Uh, we discussed with the CDC as they were brought to the table by Mr. Downing to make a proposal to us. And um, I had some misgivings about it, particularly on the Cypress Run project. I chose not to work with them, and I noticed them that they were not going to be able to conform to their promises and their business agreements, and I chose to go somewhere else. And I was told at that point and other subsequent points that if we didn't, conclude our business agreements with them, the bond financing would not be there for us. Okay. That they would yank it, it would... And, and who was saying that to you? Bob Downing. Okay. So Bob Downing, who worked for CNA, where you had a locked-in agreement, was uh, making it very difficult for you to proceed, you're alleging, and that he uh, made it very clear that you had to link up with CDC. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, <laughs> If he had not done this, what would have happened? I mean, how would things have worked out well for you? I had an, a backup agreement with a um, bank that wanted the tax credits for their own uh, balance sheet and had uh, actually gone ahead and bank uh, financed. Actually, they did a land banking function. They purchased our site and held it under a service corporation until we were ready to start construction. And they had agreed with a board resolution to buy those tax credits if um, we could go forward with the CNA financing. Yeah. And uh, when I went to uh, tell CDC that we didn't want to go forward, um, the threat of pulling the CNA insurance commitment was made to us. Now let me ask you, how could they have pulled that away from you if you had a locked-in agreement? Well, uh, the boilerplate conditions alone are about 100 pages of, of very detailed requirements to close with. There are always ways out of any bond purchase okay. agreement. It's so a locked-in agreement is not really a locked-in agreement. No. It, it, it's, a, it's an agreement to purchase bonds subject to. Okay. Uh, let me just pursue this a little bit further. Uh, now that I'm up to the point where CDC is involved, what did they do to you that put you allegedly, what do you feel they did to you that put you in the circumstance you found yourself? Well, it wasn't just the Cypress Run Project Agreement, it wasn't just the uh, um, Riviera Beach Gardens Agreement, it was also what we called our Westlake contract, our Westlake project, which was the Mod Rehab, 118 units or thereabouts for Palm Beach County. In May of 1988 or thereabouts, we entered into a syndication agreement, i.e. business agreement with CDC for them to not only syndi syndicate the tax credits available from the Mod Rehab Project, but to provide financing, permanent mortgage financing. And I believe your staff uh, has a copy of that uh, commitment. They uh, represented that uh, they could uh, and would deliver the necessary 
mortgage financing, a letter of credit for $200,000 to assist us in our working capital requirements, and finally a, a sale of tax credits which was going to result in something in the range of a million seven ultimately of, uh, of payments. Um, they defaulted under the contract, never performed, never provided the permanent financing which we were led to believe was available from the John Hancock Life Insurance Company, the ones that did Seabrook, and uh, totally uh, walked away from us on that whole matter. And to date, we've lost something in the range of a half a million dollars because of their actions. Okay. Are you aware of any other illegal, fraudulent, or illegal activities on the part of CDC Financial, its officers, stockholders, Bob Downing, and so on? Well, I had uh, outlined in my prepared text. Uh, Your prepared text will be entered in the I record in its entirety. But, but basically, the, um, the specifics of, of the actions regarding these three projects are, uh, are documented. There were instances where uh, counterpart signature pages from contracts that we signed, my partner and I signed, were used in agreements that we never saw. My attorneys never reviewed. We weren't uh, uh, given the availability of during uh, closings. Um, Guarantees that we uh, intended to make to guarantee construction costs on projects where we had the constro control of, of construction uh, were used uh, without our approval to guarantee development costs, which are much greater and widespread than just your, your construction costs. So, uh, yes, there are, are more detailed instances of um, fraud and other allegations that I've made, but they get into some detailed matters okay. that. Uh, we have uh, been able to discover to date. Right, but they'll be put on the record through your statement. I guess um, I just have to get beyond this one last point. I need to know why you felt that it was in the interests of Black Manafort and Stone, and particularly Paul Manafort, to negotiate a settlement between you and Mr. Greenblatt uh, if there is simply is no connection between the parties and that Black Manafort and Stone have done nothing wrong. I'm just curious why you would have even involved them. The reason I had, and the same goes for Mr. Goss, who was an attorney for CNA and, and was present and, and performed most of the functions at the closings for the bonds, was that they were familiar with our business disputes. Mr. Manafort's an attorney. Mr. Goss is an attorney. I have been, um, uh, based upon Palm Beach County and, and some of the circuit court activities, asked to go to arbitration, which was supposed to be seven months ago, to resolve these disputes. And CDC has broken every agreement, breached every No, you contract. didn't answer my question. Well, CDC. I'm getting to it, yeah. Congressman. And it's simply that I felt that Mr. Manafort, as well as Mr. Goss, had some uh, familiarity with the kinds of disputes we had and would like to have seen them resolved. Uh, I've never accused Mr. Goss nor Mr. Manafort of any wrongdoing. Yeah. Well, I think it's just clear from, from what your testimony that, uh, that uh, number one, there, there simply was not even any iota or possibility that this committee would have wanted your testimony or had any agreement that you would testify in order to get at anyone. Uh, and I think it's very clear uh, from your testimony, and, and uh, you do a disservice. Uh, Mr. Manafort has taken hits from me and everyone else. Um, that you did a tremendous disservice to him to bring him into this issue. And uh, uh, however uh, frustrated, hurt, uh, desperate you are, uh, ironically, you, you, you appear to be guilty of the very things that you accused uh, Mr. Greenblatt of. And um, uh, beyond that, uh, uh, it just uh, calls into question very candidly if you are that desperate, your, your testimony before the committee today. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. <clears throat> Chair would like to identify himself with Congressman Shays' observations. I think the record clearly shows that uh, uh, there is no wrongdoing uh, with respect to this whole matter on behalf of the Black Manafort firm. Their name was brought into this uh, in a totally inappropriate fashion by the witness. Um, and uh, uh, 
for the record, the chair wishes to state again that, uh, as the witness admitted under oath, uh, any suggestion of a quid pro quo for his appearance before this subcommittee is totally without foundation. Is there any additional comment you wish to make, sir? Well, I've indicated the, uh, the nature of the position that I've been put in as a result of um, HUD housing, low-income affordable housing that, that I undertook from 1984 to the present. Um, since 1972, I've acted uh, as a developer uh, under the 236 program initially, Section 8 thereafter, and ultimately the HODAG program. I've never had any problem with any projects. I've successfully completed uh, more than a dozen projects around the country. And uh, there's never been a hint of uh, impropriety or difficulty in any respect anywhere. Um, I'm not proud of what I did. I'm not happy that I did it. I have indicated... But it's not a question of your being happy. So don't, don't try to rephrase things, because we will go through this again. No, you, have, you have admitted under oath that your statement concerning a quid pro quo with this committee is a lie. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right. All right. To finish my comments, simply that uh, I've indicated uh, what I know truthfully to you about the questions you asked and the other members of the subcommittee. We appreciate that. Um, I had no uh, hesitation in being here without an attorney to uh, respond. And uh, I have my own uh, difficulties and problems, as you can see, with uh, business matters that uh, are rather overwhelming. And I'll have to, uh, to deal with that. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to testify, and uh, I think that's all I have to say. Very good. This hearing is adjourned. And coming up next, here on C-SPAN, we bring you highlights from yesterday's session in the House of Representatives concerning a constitutional amendment to ban flag burning. Good morning from the nation's capital, you're watching C-SPAN.